Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. David Pugh. I'm a staff scientist and the uh, research computing uh, core lab uh, and the visualization core lab at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm also a certified instructor with uh, software and data carpentry. And today uh, I'm here to teach you, uh, give you a bit of an introduction to uh, using Conda uh, to manage your environment uh, for your data science and scientific computing projects. So, uh, hopefully most of you uh, were able to participate in the, uh, in the setup session and you're all ready to go uh, with either your local Conda install or your binder uh, cloud instance. I'm just going to walk everybody in a minute. I'm going to share my screen and walk through just quickly the uh, getting up and running with Binder. Um, I just want to point out that on the Slack channel, um, there is a pinned message which contains links to the course materials uh, for today, which are online and will remain online. Uh, the course materials are being incubated as part of the, uh, uh, the Carpentries uh, Community Lesson Development Plan. And so they're always available and online. Uh, and the binder instance that we're going to be using today, the link to that is also always available and online. So um, if you fall behind during the, the workshop uh, today, or you want to continue kind of your learning when this is done, both the course materials uh, and the, the binder instance, obviously, as well as the video for this tutorial will be available for you guys to continue to do that. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So this is the landing page. What you should be seeing now uh, is the landing page uh, for the, the course materials. And as the title of the workshop suggests, this is an introduction to Conda. Um, so I'm going to introduce what Conda is. It's an open source package and environment management system. It works across all major operating systems, uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's useful for installing and uh, running and updating packages and dependencies. So most of what we're going to do today is um, is using Conda uh, from a terminal to create uh, environments and switch between environments and install a whole bunch of packages um, and show you how to install uh, all the major kind of packages from the Python data science ecosystem. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, about GPU uh, dependencies and managing uh, NVIDIA CUDA libraries using Conda uh, towards the end of the day. Um, and even though the focus, obviously, for this talk here at SciPy is going to be about using Conda to manage Python uh, environments and packages, uh, one of the nice things about Conda is that it, uh, it can be used to manage uh, software packages for other languages besides Python. So you can use it to manage your dependencies for languages like R, uh, Ruby, Java, C++, Fortran, um, and, and others. Uh, Julia um, uh, would be the, the major one. And this is really, uh, really useful. Uh, we have a lot of Conda users at Calst who are bioinformaticians and into uh, genomics. And those workflows have very complicated pipelines uh, that include not just Python software, uh, but Java software, command line tools written in C or C++, uh, Ruby, and Perl, and using Conda, and in particular, uh, a channel called uh, BioConda, uh, you can install and manage all of the complex uh, software dependencies for, for projects like that. Okay, so this is a rough schedule of what we're going to cover today. Um, I have uh, some links here to some prerequisites. Um, you know, I have links to basically all of the introductory uh, materials for software carpentry. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the Unix shell, um, we're going to be using the terminal today. Uh, so I may um, use some shell commands which might be unfamiliar to you. I'll try to explain them as I go along if, uh, if there are any. Um, but all of them are covered in this Unix shell lesson. So you can always go back and check up on that um, if, you're, if you're a bit unclear. Um, we're actually not going to uh, type uh, any Python. We won't be doing any Python programming today. Uh, this is all kind of before you would even start coding for your project. So there's not any to worry about with that. Um, but the first episode that we're going to cover is kind of just getting started with Conda. Uh, talk about what is Conda and kind of motivate a little bit about why you should use it. Uh, this first episode is a bit wordy, but I'm going to try to not drone on for too long. Uh, the second and the third episodes are really the meat of what the, uh, 
uh, this tutorial is about. Um, so we're going to cover working with environments, you know, how to, uh, what is an environment, how to create them, activate them, um, remove them, delete them, and deactivate them, how to install packages into uh, existing environments, um, how to create environments in different places, um, and talk about why you might want to do that. Um, and then how to explore what packages have been installed in your environments um, and how to update them and remove environments that you don't need anymore. And then sharing environments. So once we talk about how to create and just the basics of working with environments, we're going to talk about how to share them. Um, and sharing environments is uh, really useful, um, both from a, a research reproducibility standpoint, uh, making it so that your peers or research colleagues can more easily reproduce your software environment and therefore the work that you do, um, but also makes your environment, um, your software stacks portable, which is useful if you want to take um, some code that you've prototyped on your laptop or your workstation and you want to make it so that it can run in the cloud um, in one of the public clouds like uh, AWS or GCP or Microsoft Azure, or if you have access to a uh, remote computing cluster at uh, your university or research lab and you want to port your prototype uh, code and make it run on your uh, your remote computing cluster. So we're going to talk about that. The, the last two um, packages and channels are a bit more, is a bit more of a deep dive into um, some of the details of Condif that is relevant for more advanced uh, advanced use cases. And then the last one is on uh, GPU dependencies. And um, I know that when I was getting started with uh, trying to accelerate uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, workloads uh, with GPUs, managing all the additional GPU libraries um, and keeping them in sync so that they would work with either PyTorch or TensorFlow or, you know, other uh, GPU accelerated libraries is, is a real challenge and it's a real barrier for people who are getting uh, getting started. And so the last thing we're going to do today is to try to reduce that entry barrier uh, a little bit by talking about how you can use Conda to manage those, uh, those GPU dependencies. Okay, so if we go back up to the top, then there, you'll see at the top there's a link that says setup. So if you go ahead and uh, I'm going to open this in a new tab. Uh, then this has the software instructions that we spent basically the last uh, hour kind of before the tutorial going through um, to help get as many people who wanted a local install up and running with their local install. Uh, but today I'm going to recommend that you use the fantastic uh, binder service uh, for the tutorial today. So I am also going to use it unless I, I come to believe that people are uh, uh, not able to access it uh, because we've hit our 300 person max limit, in which case I'll drop off of Binder and use a local install. But if you just go ahead and click the Binder button, or maybe right click and open in the new tab, then after a couple minutes, you should see, hopefully not too many, too long, you should see the Binder instance will uh, we'll show you kind of the Jupyter Lab interface. Yep. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. So. At this point, we're, we're ready to kind of to, uh, to dive in and get started. Uh, I think for this first uh, section, I'm just going to switch back to... Uh, actually, I guess I should stop sharing just for a minute and just check the questions. So I'll pop back over here and just have a glance through, through the questions real quick before we get going. Okay. Nathaniel, yes, excited for GPU man management. <laughs> yes, that is one of the one of the nice, really nice things about Conda, um, and uh, we'll talk about that later. 
Yeah. There's okay. A, so I don't see anything. A box from oh. Rich. He wants to know if Binder provides root permission. Um, if Binder provides root permission. So I believe that the the way. So this binder instance uh, is running inside of uh, a Docker container deployed on uh, in the cloud, and I believe inside that container you have uh, user permissions under a user called uh, Jovian, which is the user for um, the Jupyter ecosystem of projects that they use in all of their Docker images. So we'll see uh, in a minute. Um, I believe it's Jovian, uh, J-O-V-Y-A-N is the username. So you will not have root permissions um, inside of that binder instance. Okay, well, let's uh, we'll go ahead and going. So I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Boom. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click click the, uh, the getting started with condom. Okay, so the main questions that we want to cover uh, quickly uh, in this section is just what is Conda uh, and then motivate why you should use Conda uh, to manage uh, your package uh, and environment management. Um, so the kind of the key objectives is to come away with an understanding of, of why a tool like Conda and Conda in particular is a good solution to these common problems that you that you face. Um, as a uh, scientist or data scientist, uh, and then uh, talk about the benefits basically of using Conda and PIP, and then we'll dive into actually learning about it. Okay, so what is Conda? So. As I mentioned briefly at the very beginning, so Conda is an open source package and environment management system that runs across uh, operating systems, so Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, so it can be used to install, uh, run, and update packages in their dependencies. And then, uh, so that's kind of Conda as a package manager. And Conda as an environment manager, you can create, save, load, switch between uh, different uh, project specific software environment. So if you want, uh, you can have for every different uh, data science project or uh, research project that you have, you can have a new Conda environment that has both the version of Python plus all of the dependencies that you need for that project and they can have different versions from all your other projects. So nothing is, you don't have um, software dependencies across projects. Um, and although Conda was created for Python programs, it can be uh, used to package and distribute software for any programming language, really. Um, many of the major programming languages are, are listed there. Uh, I should update my, my notes to include Julia. Uh, Julia is also well served uh, by Conda. Um, so there is some confusion about Conda, Mini Conda, and Anaconda. So uh, many uh, attendees at SciPy will be familiar with uh, uh, Anaconda, they will have at least heard about it and maybe have downloaded and installed Anaconda already. So if you have downloaded and installed a recent version of Anaconda, uh, then that's totally sufficient for doing the, the tutorial today. Um, Anaconda contains everything. Going back to the, the beginning, you have Conda, which is a, uh, a tool for managing packages and creating environments. So mini Conda is a way to distribute the Conda tool plus a uh, version of Python, as well as some base packages, which are, are like operating, operating system specific packages that allow Conda to work on say Windows and do Windows things and work on Linux where it needs to do Linux things and Mac where it needs to do Linuxy like things. Um, and then Anaconda, which includes Miniconda plus a whole bunch of other uh, packages, pretty much the entire scientific computing and data science centric packages, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, so hopefully this diagram will help get rid of some of the confusion about the differences between Conda, Miniconda, and Anaconda. Okay. So some motivation about why, uh, why do you want to use a package and environment management system? So, um, the kind of the too long did read version of, of this whole section is that installing software is hard. Um, installing software uh, system wide um, leads can lead to a number of problems. Um, 
in that um, it can also be difficult to figure out which uh, which software is required for any particular research project when you just have everything installed in mass system wide on your computer and you want to know what am I using on this project, project A, and how is it different than what's being used on project B. It's hard to, to figure that out sometimes if you're installing everything system wide. It also makes it often impossible to have different versions of software package installed at the same time. If you're installing everything globally, then you can only do a global update. So you can't have two different versions of the same software library installed if you're installing everything globally. And if you update software, then that might break software that's used on another project that requires different version numbers. And so then you have to try to find some middle ground on version numbers that work across all of your projects. And that's really challenging. Um, so th the basic idea is that um, installing uh, software and managing the software system-wide can create these interdependencies between research projects that really shouldn't exist. Um, and the more that you can minimize those, the simpler your life will be. So it would be great um, if we could, instead of installing software system-wide, um, then, you know, could we install software separately maybe for each research project? Um, so why don't we just take a couple minutes. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So in the chat, if you could just put some, um, some ideas about this kind of discussion question. So did you guys see any potential benefits uh, from uh, installing software separately for each project? What might be some of the costs? Um, things like that. So I'm going to stop sharing and just take a look at the chat and see what, what you guys kind of come up with. I hope we haven't hit our limit. Hmm. Finder is not opening. Okay. Um, let's try to figure out what is going on with that. Um, could somebody maybe post into um, into the chat? Uh, I don't know. A, can you post a screenshot or um, or something? Or maybe on Slack. Uh, maybe Laurie can help sort this out on Slack. And I'll. Okay. So it's possible that we have hit our limit which is both good in the sense that there's lots of people here today to work with us and bad in that some of them might not be able to run Finder. Ah, found, found built image launching. So uh, just try uh, just refreshing. Sometimes that uh, that's enough to do it. Okay, so let me look down at some of the, uh, some of the chat. So cost, lots of, disk, lots of disk space if you use many similar environments. So yes, so Conda actually tries to do quite a lot of clever caching um, to make sure that um, if you have the exact build of a particular package that's used on multiple projects that you don't download and have multiple copies of that same package lying around. So it does some fancy caching to try to mitigate cost, but that's a good one. Um, uh, space would be a cost that's similar. Um, what else do we have here? Valve version control. Not sure what uh, what is meant by that, except that if you have um, if you're installing uh, software for different projects, then yes, you have to have some way to basically control the versions that you're using across all those projects, or you might have made your life even more difficult than just installing software system wide. So yes, but that's where a tool like Conda comes in is to help control those versions between your different projects. Getting confused. Yes. So one, uh, one very real cost is that you, if you have, you know, a different environment for different projects, of course you have to remember to somehow activate the environment for that project before you, start working on that project. So I, I have definitely made that mistake more than a few times. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Um, good. I'm glad that Greg doesn't have 299 binders running. So uh, research reproducibility. So that's a, um, 
that's a big potential win uh, from using a tool like Honda and maintaining separate project specific software environments is it allows you to very quickly know which bits of software are being used for that project. And um, with the Conda environment file specification that we're going to talk about in a little bit allows you to share a text file, which allows others to recreate your environment on their local machine. Uh, David, we have a couple of questions in the question. Uh, All right. Okay. Thank uh, you. How is Conda different than using uh, a container, i.e. Docker containers? So that's a very good question. Um, so the way to think about um, Docker containers in Conda is, is that, so a Docker container uh, or Docker is basically kind of in a very holistic approach to environment isolation. So it isolates basically an entire OS inside of a Docker image plus everything that is needed on top of that. And, uh, but within a Docker container, if you're working on a Python project, you still have to have uh, a tool to manage the packages that you want installed into that container. So a Docker is only kind of part of the solution for a Python data science or scientific computing project. Yes, Docker provides environment isolation, but within Docker, you need to use a tool like Conda or PIP to manage the packages that you want installed inside that uh, Docker image. So although if talking about how to make Docker and Conda work together is kind of outside the scope of this particular tutorial, which I, I want to focus more on, on getting people up and running with Conda, um, it is important to note that they solve complementary problems. So that's a good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and is there a standard operating procedure you can point us to for how Conda is meant to interact with the system path? I occasionally have issues calling libraries from specific Python's environment because it couldn't find the right, right. Okay. So, um, so this is a, a, a very kind of technical deep dive question. So I'll, I'll just give a quick overall here uh, or summary here. So um, the way that Conda interacts with the system path is um, Conda, uh, a Conda environment, as we're going to see uh, shortly, is basically just a, a directory. And inside that directory, it installs all the software. And so when it comes time for you, when you want to use that particular environment, then Conda at that point prepends the path to the Conda environment directory to your system path. And then everything that you need for that environment is inside that directory and it'll get picked up first on the path. So it does very minimal um, um, changes to your system path, and when, but only when you activate an environment. And when you deactivate an environment, it removes that uh, directory from the system path. So much more I think could probably be said about that, but it would be a bit too uh, a bit too technical for right now. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So I think we had a good discussion of the the kind of the cost and the benefits of um, of uh, of so project specific uh, software installs. Um, so now I want to kind of move on. So I'm going to go back to sharing screen. <clears throat> and I should remind people, if you're using Binder, uh, Binder will time out after 10 or 15 minutes. So um, please make sure to do something on Binder um, to make it aware that you're, you're still there. You know, hit some keys or type a command or two uh, in the terminal. Um, OK. So now we've talked a little bit about um, global software install versus project specific software install. So just a, a, a highlight basically of the um, environment management and package management problems that uh, data scientists or uh, scientific computing, uh, scientific uh, users typically run into. So, um, and these are kind of the problems that Conda solves basically. So, um, you have an application uh, that you need for a research project and you need different versions 
uh, of your base programming language or different versions of third-party packages from the versions that you're currently using. So I saw a number of people in the chat bring this up as a problem that they face. So they need to have different versions of packages installed. So that's a uh, that's an environment management uh, problem that Conda is going to help us solve. Um, so another problem that you commonly encounter is an application that uh, you developed maybe six months or a year ago as part of some previous research project worked fine at the time, given the state of your system and the software that's installed, but now it doesn't work because you've updated stuff, but you actually maybe don't know what was updated. So you don't really know exactly what broke your software. Uh, so that's a problem. So Conda is going to help us solve that as well. Um, you know, you wrote some code for a research project that works on your machine, but not on your collaborator's machine. Very common problem. Um, that can be mitigated uh, with Conda environments and particularly Conda environment files. So we can share an environment file with our research peers or colleagues so that they can reproduce the same environment on their machine. Um, and the same goes for local to remote. So you know, something that works on your local machine that maybe runs Mac or, or Windows, but then remote computing clusters often run Linux. And so Conda will help us move uh, environments from our local uh, machines to remote clusters. Okay. Uh, and then package management. And so uh, in addition to the environment management problem, like once you have a particular environment, then you need to install and maintain packages. So you need a way of identifying and installing compatible versions of software, plus all the required dependencies and dependencies of dependencies and so on. And they needed to be able to update those when more recent versions become available. So there are many tools uh, for doing this. Um, at the operating system level on Linux, you might have, if you're an Ubuntu user, you might have run into apt. Uh, there's yum for CentOS. Um, there's something, there's the homebrew project uh, for Mac uh, users that does, uh, tries to bring a Linux-like package management system to Mac. Um, on Windows, there's not really something like uh, an OS-like package manager. No. Um, but that's a more general problem. So as um, scientists or data scientists who are working on uh, research uh, computing projects, um, we don't necessarily need to solve the environment management problem at that level. Uh, what we have is a, usually a base programming language like Python, R, uh, Julia, SQL maybe. Um, and then we need to uh, manage that language plus some third-party packages for our project. So we have a slightly easier problem. So there are many kind of, there are, I should say a few uh, solutions to this problem. Um, and the one that I'm going to talk about today is the one that I personally found to be most uh, impactful uh, and useful in my own research, which is what I call con or it's Conda plus PIF. And uh, so Conda solves both the environment and package uh, management problems. Um, so it's, what Conda provides is pre-built uh, packages, which come in the form of binaries. And so it generally, um, although we'll see some exceptions to this later, avoids the need to deal with compilers at all. So the, pack, the Conda package that you find is going to be a pre-compiled binary that targets uh, your operating system. Um, and so you generally don't have to worry about uh, compiler tool chains and compiling uh, software. Um, this is really useful in the scientific community because often compiling uh, scientific software is quite challenging um, and cumbersome. And um, it can be very difficult to build tools, build scientific uh, research code from source correctly, uh, consistently. And so by working at the pre-compiled binary level uh, kind, of, kind of avoids all of this complexity. Um, and the data science community, TensorFlow is another tool that uh, is very difficult to install uh, from source, uh, but very easy to install with GPU support, even with Conda. Um, and again, it's cross-platform, so it works with uh, Windows, Mac, uh, and Linux. And um, also targets several hardware platforms, uh, x86, Power8, Power9, um, and uh, all of this kind of helps with reproducibility. So um, Conda also works well with, um, with other uh, package management tools like PIP. 
which is the default kind of uh, package management tool for uh, in the Python community. Um, support for pip and conda gets better with every, uh, I think, every new release of conda. Um, and so I, my approach to uh, using conda with pip, we're going to see several examples of this throughout the day. But the, the, my general kind of best practice is I use conda wherever possible and pip only where necessary. Um, there are things that are simply not available via conda. Um, a lot of, of very new code uh, or some code, some authors don't distribute their, uh, their code via uh, conda packages. Um, but you will always find a Python package on the Python package index. And anything you find on the Python package index can be installed via pip. Um, and a nice, a nice benefit of, um, of also using Conda is that it can um, provide uh, pre-compiled binaries of the core scientific computing libraries like NumPy, SciPy, TensorFlow, and others that are pre-compiled with Intel's MQL um, and, or CUDA uh, where appropriate, um, which just provides you nice optimized uh, versions of those packages without uh, having to change any of your code. Okay, so just to kind of sum up, this is the, the only kind of non-hands-on section uh, for today. Uh, but the key points that I want you to take away is that um, Conda is platform agnostic, it's open source, it solves both the package and environment management problems uh, that you face. Um, it facilitates portability, uh, either of your code from your laptop to a colleague's laptop or workstation, and also from your laptop to a remote computing cluster at your, maybe at your university or in the public cloud, and reproducibility. Um, and that it now becomes, when you submit your paper uh, to a journal or to a conference, um, or you need to you know, reproduce some results for, um, some bit of uh, workflow that you're doing in industry, you know, Conda environment uh, is a good tool for helping uh, that reproducibility. Um, and then the combination of Conda and PIP kind of hits the sweet spot of um, solving both the package environment management problems while targeting multiple programming languages. Um, so usually um, you'll have tool, other tools will either target environment management or uh, package management separately, um, or they're only targeted a particular programming language. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing now just so I can take a look at the chat um, and see what kind of questions we might have uh, before I move on to the next, uh, next episode, which is a bit more hands-on. Instead of the chat, can you take a look at the question and answer box? There's quite a few questions in here now. All right. Okay. I will, I will do that. Um, so question, does Conda allow um, setting environment variables? So yes. So one of the things, we'll, we'll talk about this in the next episode, but one of the, the things that Conda does when you activate an environment is that it will set environment variables that the package authors have specified to the values that are required in order for the code to operate properly. But this is very common in scientific computing situations where uh, in order to, you know, to use the code, you need to have environment variables set at certain things. And Conda will take care of that automatically if the package authors have said that certain environment variables need to be set to these values. Um, but you can also set your own environment variable, uh, environment variables just like you would in any other uh, kind of a bash environment before you uh, activate the environment if you needed to do something specific. Uh, environment does include variables like path and LD library path. Um, and I'll, uh, Vu, if you uh, remind me about that later, when we do hands-on, I'll show an example of that. Uh, installing your own package locally. What is the best practice for installing your own package locally while developing in Conda? Um, I, when I've done that, I have used the pip install e, uh, just as you have done there inside of an active Conda environment. Um, and we'll, 
Okay. Wow. We do have quite a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, is there a way to extend the Conda environment, but still with isolation? So, uh, so I would have multiple environments to share a common set of packages. Um, so Conda does that for you uh, automatically. So um, it has some caching that goes on behind the scenes so that if you have uh, multiple environments that use the same build of the same version of the same package, then Conda will make sure that there are, I, I believe it does this via symlink um, behind the scenes, but it will make sure that your environments are, are effectively sharing that same binary um, so that you don't have this kind of bloat of installing uh, the same version, the same build of the same version of the same package over and over again, because it's used in many environments. Okay. Uh, so benefits of Conda over other environment uh, options like uh, virtual environment. So um, for me, the, the main benefit uh, that I have found um, using Conda over some of the other options is um, it's one tool and like three commands um, that solve both the package and environment management problems. So if you want to use uh, VMB uh, uh, virtual environment or like pip env, you know, you have, there's an environment management and a package management tool. So there's two tools instead of one. So that's, uh, that's one. The other is that for a lot of data science and scientific uh, computing use cases, which are basically the all of the use cases that, that I personally have, um, Conda is really targeted directly at those communities. And so it makes it easy if I have, if I'm working with uh, someone in like bioinformatics or genomics and they have a really complicated software pipeline that has Perl, Java, uh, some C++ command line tools, plus Python, plus maybe some GPU dependencies, I can manage all of those with Conda. And I'm unaware of another uh, environment package management system that can do that. And so that's where those kinds of advanced use cases are where I think Conda really separates itself from the other, uh, the other tools out there. Uh, okay. Um, lots of good questions in here. So what I w want to do, if I haven't answered your question, then maybe what we could do is, um, some of those questions could be transferred over to the Slack channel, and then I can pick them and answer them um, kind of offline later. And that way I can get to everybody's question without breaking up too much the flow of um, uh, the flow of the tutorial. So I'm going to, I'm going to switch back now to, um, to teaching. So I'm going to go back to screen sharing. Share screen. Okay. And now we're going to jump over to the next episode, working with environments. Okay. And I'm just going to go over here and check on my... Oh, so this is, the, this is what, what, what you will see if your binder has, has timed out. So I'm going to close this out, and I'm going to go back and try to relaunch binder again. And I will come back and check on that momentarily. So we're going to talk about, in this episode, we're going to talk about what is a Conda environment, talk about how to create and delete, activate and deactivate Conda environments and what that means, how to install packages into existing environments using Conda and PIP. Um, we're going to talk about where you should create environments um, and how do you find out what packages have been installed in a particular environment how to find out how many environments exist on your machine and where they live, and then how to delete environments that aren't needed. Um, so those are the questions. And then by the end of this, you should know how to use Conda to do all of those things, the basic idea. Okay, so Conda environment is basically a, 
Uh, it's just a directory that contains a specific collection of Conda packages that you have installed. There's some structure to this directory um, that's important, but I think outside the scope of this introductory tutorial, but it's, it's just a directory. So when we get to deleting an environment, basically deleting an environment is effectively just deleting a directory and all of its contents, a few other things. Um, but you know, if you have a research project that requires a particular version of, of a core dependency like NumPy, um, but you have uh, an older project that needs an older version of NumPy and can't work with the newer version, um, then you can have these two different environments and one environment for your older project can have NumPy 1.12 and then the new version can have NumPy 1.18 and there's going to be no problem. And you can activate and deactivate and switch between these environments as you need. So um, as we're going to see in a minute, there's something called the base environment. Uh, and you want to avoid installing uh, packages directly into the base conda environment. So the, the base conda environment contains just a uh, default a version of Python plus your OS specific uh, libraries. And just as a general best practice, it's, it's best to just allow that to be just Conda plus Python plus the core OS libraries and always create additional environments for your projects and don't just install things into your base environment. Okay. So without further ado, so at this point, I'm going to switch away from the, the, the teaching notes um, and switch over to Jupyter Lab. Um, so if you want, you can try to kind of like maybe split screen the, the teaching notes if you want to follow the teaching notes. Uh, and then you can have your Jupyter Lab instance up in Binder um, to use. Um, so that way, make, uh, make it easier for the interactive portions of the tutorial. Okay, so this is Jupyter Lab. You know, many of you uh, may have used Jupyter Lab, may use Jupyter Lab frequently, or may never have used Jupyter Lab. So just quickly, Jupyter Lab is kind of the next generation um, interface of the Jupyter project. So we have the classic Jupyter notebooks. Um, you can click this and launch a Jupyter notebook uh, if you wanted to, um, or a Python console, which you could click this to launch a console. Um, today, we're actually going to be using a terminal. So if you click the terminal uh, icon, then eventually you'll get a terminal. And so today we're going to do everything in a terminal. Um, and we won't touch Python consoles or, or Jupyter notebooks or anything like that. Um, so this area here where the terminal is, is called the main work area. Uh, and then over here on the left, we have the kind of like the file manager area. Um, I am going to... Um, just make this go away uh, for most of the day, just to give us some more more screen to to work with. So, um, the the first thing I want to do is to actually just navigate into a new directory uh, for all of our work today. So there's a, a Unix command called ls, which just lists out the contents of a, a current directory. So um, in this directory, we have uh, a binder directory and an introduction to conda directory. So if we use the command cd, uh, which is short for change directories, we can change into the introduction to conda directory. And at this point, there's nothing in this directory. It's just blank. So if we do ls, there's nothing there. So we basically, this is just an empty directory that we're going to work in today um, so that we all have kind of a consistent place. So now we're going to create our first environment. So we're on the teaching notes, we're in the creating uh, environment section. Um, and so the command to create a new environment is conda create. So we could type conda and then create. And then if we type uh, help, uh, oops. Uh, no. Sorry, I got the dash dash help. There we go. Um, so for all of the conda commands, if you type dash dash help or just dash h, you'll get the help menu for the command. And you can go through here and read about the different options. Um, 
uh, at the top, you can see kind of the, the typical syntax uh, for the command that is, and then um, the different options. So things we're going to be working with a lot are dash dash name. So you create an environment by name. So that's what we're going to do first. And then we're, later we're going to switch to creating envir uh, environments by prefix, which, where we specify the path to the directory for the content environment. Um, and there are other more advanced options that uh, are not relevant uh, for us at present, but I just wanted you to know how to get help uh, if you if you need it. So I'm just going to type clear, uh, which is a command to just clear out the terminal so I get back um, some more working space. And so now we're going to create an environment. So the first thing that we might want to do is to create just an environment that has a particular version of Python and a particular version of pip. So we can do that by doing uh, conda create, and we'll create by name, and we'll just call this uh, maybe Python uh, 3. And then after we have the name of the environment, we do a space, and we'll just type Python space, and then pip, and we'll hit enter. And what Conda is doing, once you hit enter, is it's going out and collecting metadata about the, um, about the packages that you've asked to be installed, which was just Python and pip. But then it's going to check for all of the dependencies for those packages that are required to be installed. And so these are actually all listed here. And these are operating system specific. So here we're running on uh, uh, Linux. And so these are all different pack packages and dependencies that are required just to install Python and just to install pip. And notice that we didn't specify any version numbers. So we just wrote uh, um, conda create and then the name of our environment and then Python and pip. We didn't say anything about what versions we wanted. And so by default, conda, if you don't say what version you want, conda will find the most recent mutually consistent set of uh, of packages that are available. And so you'll see that we've actually installing Python 3.8 and pip 20.1. And then we have some more specific information. Uh, we'll talk about those other columns later, but the version numbers that are being installed are what I wanted to show you. And by default, Conda will always ask you to confirm that you want to create um, and I'll show you in a minute how to make it so that we don't have to type yes. But then once you confirm, then Conda will run off and download all of the packages, extract them into the directory, um, configure any uh, additional setup that needs to be done. And now it's done. And so at this point, what we have is a prompt to say, okay, if you want to activate this environment, then this is the command conda activate and then the name of the environment. And then to deactivate the environment, you just type conda deactivate. So we'll get to that uh, in a minute. Um, but one of the things that, so first off, um, that's practice, always install pip into every conda environment you create. Uh, the reason for doing that is um, most operating, all operating systems that I've used come with a system version of Python. And that system version of Python often needs its own packages that work specifically with that system version of Python to run your operating system. Most operating systems use, well, some use pip to manage those dependencies. And so your, your operating system may already have pip installed. So, you want to make sure whenever you run the command pip install, you want to make sure that it runs and installs into your conda environment, into the conda environment that you want it to install into. And the way to ensure that is to simply always install pip into every conda environment. That way, when you have, you're working inside of a conda environment, you type pip install, it's using the pip package that's actually installed in your conda environment and make sure that everything that is installed with pip and updated with pip will be also installed into that conda environment. 
So I will always install pip into all of my Conda environments. Um, another thing I like to do is always give version numbers. So here we just have a Python 3 environment and this Python 3 is Python 3.8, um, but it would be a, a little bit better I would think I think is to create um, instead of Python three. Let's maybe be specific and say, well, actually, what we really want is maybe Python. I'll say three, um, three six, just to be consistent with the notes. And so here, if you said to specify versions for a particular package, you type uh, uh, Python or the name of the package equals and then a version number. So I typically specify major and minor versions. So the major version is three, the minor version is six. So we'll do three, six, and then pip 20.1. Uh, <clears throat> and then hit enter. Now, Conda is going to go, and I'll hit just yes, and enter. So Conda is going to go off and find the most, uh, the mutually most recent mutually consistent set of packages that are consistent with the constraints that I provided, which was that the Python version must be 3.6 and that the um, pip version must be pip 20.1. And then you can see, so we needed to download Python 3.6 and pip was already downloaded because we downloaded that before. And then, um, so now we have installed another uh, Conda environment, but with a specific version of Python. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the next trick is, so I, I've mentioned that you should always, always install or always specify your version numbers. That can be a bit tricky if you don't really know what the most recent version number is of the package that you might want to install. And so there's a, a nice, a uh, tool called Conda or a nice command called Conda search. And so if you don't know the name of, or you don't know the version of the package that you want to install, you can just do Conda search and let's do like scikit-learn. So if I do Conda search scikit-learn, Conda is going to go off and search the, uh, the, the channels, which is basically the locations online that have uh, Conda packages that Conda is aware of, um, which by default is the defaults channel and often a channel called Conda Forge. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but it's going through and it's searching for all the versions of scikit-learn that it can find. And you can see just by scrolling through here that there's quite a bit. So, versions of scikit-learn going back uh, to version, at least version 0.17 um, and different versions of Python. So you'll see Python 2.7, Python 3.5, Python 3.6, <clears throat> and, and so forth. So the Conda search command is really useful because it allows us to figure out what versions of uh, of packages might be available before we specify the version numbers. So another example of the conda create command. So if you want to create um, an environment with multiple packages, so here I'm going to use the command further down on the page and the, and the lecture notes, I'm going to create a basic uh, SciPy environment. And I'm going to install into this environment um, uh, IPython uh, 7.13, which I think was the most recent version when I made these split notes, and matplotlib uh, 3.1, numpy 1.18, and scipy 1.4. Okay, and I'll hit enter. And again, Conda is going to run off and find versions of these packages. That are mutually consistent. Oh, I forgot. I forgot pip, so I'm going to say no. 
And I'm going to go back and I'm going to put pip. Um, and notice I am not specifying a particular version of Python. I could do that, um, but since Python, um, since Python is obviously a dependency of all of these packages, I'll just let Conda pick out the most recent version of Python that's consistent with the other dependencies here. I'll do 20 dot. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. So while this is going, um, you know, a little bit more details about like on the technical side of what uh, Conda is doing. So Conda sets up a um, kind of like a, uh, a satisfiability problem with all of the uh, all of the constraint with the constraint specified by the package version numbers, and it, then it goes through and it finds um, for all of the dependencies that you're installing, it finds. Uh, a set of packages that solves that uh, satisfiability problem. So when you install Conda packages, <clears throat> or when you create an environment and you install packages into it, you're, you're guaranteed to have a set of uh, consistent um, packages, basically. <clears throat> Okay, so as you can see, we're going through here. Now we have a lot of packages to actually download. Um, we've got, we're downloading, you saw, maybe saw matplotlib go by there. Um, uh, I might have missed numpy or scipy when it went through. Um, there's lib open blast, which is a uh, low level linear algebra library, a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but now we're done. And if we wanted to activate this uh, environment, uh, we could type conda activate basic scipy environment. Um, so now what I want to do, uh, there's an exercise uh, creating a new environment um, in, the, in the teaching notes. And so I'm going to kind of give you all about five minutes to take a look at that, uh, that exercise. So create a new environment uh, called machine learning in that includes Python plus the most current versions of IPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn. Okay, so it's similar to the commands that we've just been typing, but slightly different. Um, so I'm going to uh, give you guys about five minutes to take a look at that, and then I'm going to switch back and start looking through the chat um, and ask a question to see what kind of questions have uh, have accumulated. So I'll stop sharing. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. So everyone's found the uh, the link to the teacher. Excellent. All right. I'm going to check out ask ask a question. Okay, so uh, someone mentioned portability. Oh, and can you touch about practical implementations of Conda on diverse platforms? Most obvious question is ARM support. I uh, couldn't install Conda. Right, so unfortunately, I don't have that much experience using Conda uh, on ARM uh, yet. Um, in part because I don't have access to the hardware, and in part because I'm not sure that Conda really supports it yet. Uh, but that's a good question. Maybe I can look into that after the tutorial and maybe put something in Slack about what I find. Right, so there's a question about poetry instead of pip and Conda. Um, so I've never used uh, poetry. Um, so, and if it's widely used outside of research computing, um, that may be why I haven't had that much exposure uh, exposure to it. Um, but for the purposes of these um, these teaching notes, I will take a look at poetry and see where it might fit in as a as a call out box or uh, or something within these these teaching notes. Because the, the whilst the focus is on uh, conda, 
and PIP. It's mostly because Conda and PIP I've, I've found is the best tool for supporting data science and scientific computing users. Um, but I definitely want to make people aware of the diverse set of options that might be out there. <clears throat> uh, usual timeline for getting pre-compiled versions of, say, TensorFlow into Conda. Um, so for TensorFlow, it seems to be pretty quick. Um, I think because there's a lot of institutional support uh, from Anaconda and NVIDIA and, and others in, uh, to make sure that those kind of core packages are very quickly available. Uh, for other tools like PyTorch, um, it's almost instantaneous and rapid because uh, Conda is the recommended way of installing those packages. So they are always made available kind of first via Conda um, or at the same time as they're made available basically on PyPI. So whenever they cut a new release, it's immediately available via Conda. <clears throat> um, Jupyter Notebook does not show the new environment I just installed even when activated. Do I need to refresh? We'll talk uh, about how to get your Jupyter Notebooks to recognize the content environment that you just created um, later. It's a good question. Um, so attaching a specific created environment to a notebook is a question that we're going to explicitly cover uh, in a little bit. Um, so if I'm skipping questions in the question and answer, it's in part because I know that we're going to cover them in a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, Eshin has a good question. Um, so what's the preferred way to handle Jupyter Lab or Notebook in multiple content environments? Should you reinstall Jupyter Lab or Notebook in each separate content environment? Or is it preferred to use a single consistent Jupyter version um, and then um, choose environments within Jupyter. Okay. Um, so part of this, we're going to explicitly cover, we're going to cover how to make Jupyter aware of Conda environments that you've created so that you can launch notebooks, for example, uh, and Python consoles based on those environments. So that would be in the kind of, you have an umbrella Jupyter environment. Or you have an umbrella uh, <clears throat> environment where you manage Jupyter, and then you create Conda environments and create notebooks within Jupyter, uh, the Jupyter Lab. Um, that's one way of working. The other way is to install Jupyter in every notebook. And there's no good answer to this. And the reason is that, um, for example, Jupyter Lab has an amazing ecosystem of extensions. And some of these extensions are really important for projects that depend on certain packages. Like for example, Dask, if you use Dask a lot, then uh, Dask has a lot of nice uh, Jupyter Lab extensions that are really useful and you would want to have around, um, but you wouldn't want to have those around for all of your projects because some of your projects might not use Dask. So personally, since I, the same is true of like say GPU, um, projects. So there's a lot of extensions that to Jupyter Lab that make working with uh, GPUs uh, or monitoring your GPU utilization a lot easier. Um, Jupyter Lab NV dashboard is an example of, of one such uh, Jupyter Lab extension. And, um, but that's only relevant for GPU projects. You wouldn't necessarily want to have that installed for your Jupyter Lab that you use for all of your projects. So I tend to have Jupyter Lab installed and configured separately for each project that I work on. Um, but that I work on a very diverse set of projects for both myself and also the, the clients that I work with at Calf. Um, so we're going to see examples of, of both approaches basically today. Um, okay, so I've tried to hit on as many of these as I could and um, in the five minutes that we set aside for that exercise, so I'll, I'll keep coming back to these questions. And if I keep skipping the question, it's because I'm going to cover it uh, 
later in the in the tutorial. Okay, so let's quickly share my screen. So one of the things I, I want to point out about these um, about these lesson notes is that all of the exercises have a solution, and you can see the solution by simply clicking the, the, the down arrow, which basically gives you kind of my solution. may not be the only solution, um, but my solution to this, uh, this particular question. Um, so for this one, um, I'm not going to actually go through the solution in the interest of time, but just to show you that the, the syntax is exactly the same. It's the same kind of create command. We created the environment by name. So we use dash dash name. And then we called this machine learning environment. And then we installed, um, again, if you don't specify the version numbers, like just IPython, you just listed out the IPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, Pip, uh, Python, Scikit-Learn, um, then you would get the most recent mutually compatible version of all those libraries. But if you wanted to, you could obviously pin the version numbers by specifying the version numbers. Okay. Um, uh, actually, now that I think about it, I should probably go ahead and create this environment because I may end up using it later. So I will do conda create environment name. Oops. Getting ahead of myself. Conda create name machine learning environment. And what did we need? So we wanted uh, IPython. Oops. IPython matplotlib uh, pandas. scikit-learn, so uh, and that's it. Okay, and now, since I don't want to have to confirm all of this, I'll just type dash dash yes. So that avoids having to specify um, type yes, proceed. See, so it just kind of blew through that step. Um, and one thing to note is as we create more and more environments, um, Conda will, uh, end up downloading fewer and fewer packages because if it sees that the same build or the same version of the same package has already been downloaded and is available, then it will it will make it that the new environment uses those packages instead of downloading them and again. Okay, so there we go. So we've got some practice creating environments. So the next thing we want to do is just talk about how to activate and deactivate environments. Um, so activating environments is uh, uh, is important because basically it does two things. So the mechanical thing that activating an environment does is it prepends the path to your content environment directory to your system path, and that's what makes um, that's what makes your your operating system find um, the Python version that you've installed in that environment and all the dependencies available in that environment. Um, available first out of all the other environments that might be available on your machine and over the same version or versions of those things that might be installed on your system. So it, it prepends path to the system path variable, and then it runs any activation script. So some environments or some packages rather um, have more complicated activation things that need to be done. Environment variables need to be set properly. Uh, things of this nature, and that will be done at the time that you write conda activate. So if I type now um, uh, conda activate uh, basic scipy environment. Okay, so what happened there? So note that the I'll type clear to clear out my prompt. So notice that the, the prompt changed slightly. So before there was nothing here, and now we have basic SciPy environment. 
And so that's kind of the default way that Conda notifies you visually as to what environment is actually active. And then, of course, we have our user at, and then this long thing is our host in the container running in the cloud, and then the path to our current directory. So that makes for a long uh, bash prompt. But now that we've activated this, um, uh, we could use it to do stuff. If we wanted to deactivate then the environment, we do a conda deactivate. Okay. And uh, this is just a bit of a quirk on Binder. That when you run conda deactivate, it takes you back to the, the, the base um, Binder environment, which is something called Notebook. So we well, don't need to worry about that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so that's an example of conda activate and then conda deactivate. Um, sometimes you can <clears throat> accidentally type maybe conda uh, deactivate con to deactivate multiple times or something, and all of a sudden you lose your base environment. Okay, um, that's okay. You can always get it back by just typing conda activate without any um, without any environment name, and you'll get the default environment, the base environment back. Okay. Um, okay. So now there are a couple of exercises. Um, that in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of uh, go through together. So the first exercise is activate the machine learning environment uh, and then deactivate. Those are the two exercises. So the way that we would do that would just be conda activate mach machine learning environment. So just the name of the environment. Yeah. And so now you can see we've activated the machine learning environment over here. And then if we wanted to deactivate it, we would type conda deactivate. Okay. And I you know, make my text just a little bit smaller um, so I can try to fit all the commands onto one, uh, one line. Okay. So now we've covered how to create environments and how to activate and deactivate the environment. So what about um, installing packages into an existing environment? So when we've created our environment so far, we've listed out all of the packages that we want to install into that environment. Um, but what if we either we forget a package that we wanted to install or we find out later that, oh, there's this new package that I hadn't heard of before that I want to install into my existing con environment. So how do I do that? Um, so let's let's see an example. So if we do, um, I'm going to type clear again. Uh, conda activate our basic uh, SciPy environment. Okay. So now let's install. Um, uh, there's an interesting project uh, called Numba. Uh, there is a link to that in the. Um, uh, in the, the teaching notes. So I will just pull up, give a plug to the number, the number guys. Um, so number is a, a really interesting project that um, does uh, just in time compiling of Python and NumPy code to translate it into fast machine code. And um, it can be used to substantially speed up your Python um, and maybe even NumPy code a little bit. And particularly it can actually target uh, GPU code, you can compile down uh, code to run on the GPU. So it's a really cool project, uh, definitely something that you should be aware of in the, uh, in the data science space in Python. So if we wanted to install that into our basic SciPy environment, once we've activated the environment, we would just do conda install, um, well, we could do conda search, maybe. Um, on number, just to see kind of what versions of number were uh, were out there. Um, but then, if we weren't really sure um, what version of number 
might be compatible with everything else that we've already installed, we could just do conda install number. And then we'll see what conda picks up as being the most recent mutually compatible version, version of number that's compatible with everything else that we've already installed. It looks like number 0.50. So that's the most recent version of number. Okay, and then we'll just say yes. <clears throat> Okay, now again, I, I do like to install, generally install using um, uh, version numbers. So if an example of that, so scikit-learn is not installed in, um, uh, in this environment. So I'll do conda install uh, scikit-learn equals, and then 0 0.22, just as a, a very a recent version of scikit-learn. And so that's an example of how to install a package with a specific version number into the environment. Now, if I had specified a version number of scikit-learn that turned out to be incompatible with something that was already installed in my environment, Conda would tell me. It would fail to solve, uh, it would fail here at this step. Uh, and then it would tell me that it had been unable to find a package with that version number that was compatible and it would tell me the packages that were in error so that I could come up with a solution as to what I wanted to do. Um, right, okay, so then it is, yes, I want to install. Um, okay, um, so just an aside and then another exercise. So, um, so when you install a package into an existing environment, Conda takes a little bit of freedom that if it needs to, um, if it needs to, it will update packages that are installed in your environment already to more recent versions. If it needs to accommodate the most recent, if it needs to do that to accommodate the most recent version of the package you want to install. So this in the lecture notes, this is covered under the freezing installed packages call out box. Um, so if you don't want that behavior, if you want to force Conda to fix the packages that are already installed to whatever versions they already have, then you can pass the dash dash freeze installed option. And then that's basically forcing Conda to be more strict and to kind of fail and give you an error if it's not possible to install this new package that you want to install without changing the versions um, that are already installed. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, please ask the question. So let's take a five minute break. So in the lecture notes, there are two, um, uh, two exercises. Um, installing a package into a specific environment, um, and then installing packages into a conda environment using pip. So um, we have a machine learning environment here. So we want to activate that environment, uh, and then you want to install Dask uh, using the conda install command. Um, and then uh, the second exercise is to use pip uh, and the pip install command to install a package called combo, uh, which is a really interesting uh, package that uh, solves a, a problem called ensemble learning and it's widely used uh, in data science competitions like Kaggle, um, but it's not available via Conda. You can only get it via pip. Okay, so let's take a, a kind of a short five minute break so to speak, and you can take a look at those exercises and then I will look through some of the questions. Um, Lori, or uh, is there any way for me to clear out the questions and answers or is that something that only Mike can do? I think that's the that's something only I can do. So if you tell me which questions you think you've answered, I can knock uh, them out. Okay, um, so uh, the, the top voted one, environment include variables, so I, I covered that one. Um, and then can you create a new environment? Uh, I talked about that one. 
Um, Right. Okay. So portability is a pro. Um, so if an individual environment becomes very large in disk space, how portable can it be? So um, the way that in the environment, so you're right. So if you have this huge environment, that could be, you know, many gigs uh, of packages. Um, porting that would be analogous to like uh, having this big Docker image, which would be a big you know, multi gigabyte image file and porting that. So what's nice about Conda and the next episode we're going to cover this is that you can have a simple text file, which specifies in a structured way, the dependencies of your project. And that's the file that you share. And so when you want to port an environment from one system to another, you're just basically moving this text file and then rebuilding the environment on the new, uh, whether it's on a, another laptop or workstation or on a remote cluster. So that's the way you get the portability is by you port the environment specification, not the whole environment. Um, is Mamba a reasonable alternative to Conda? So the, the Mamba project uh, and the, the ecosystem, the community ecosystem around uh, uh, Conda is definitely an interesting thing to watch. Um, Mamba um, was created to speed up uh, certain parts of Conda that were found to be uh, slow uh, for the, the users that created Mamba. Um, so the, the goal of Mamba is to be a drop-in replacement for Conda that accelerates uh, uh, sometimes slow portions of the uh, Conda environment solving and creation process. Um, and that is on my to-do list is to have actual uh, um, discussion of Mamba and the ecosystem around it in, inside these notes at some point. Um, the registry index of the environment, that's in about 10 minutes. We're going to cover, uh, cover that, to keep track of all your environments. Um, somebody integration testing packages from various channels against each other. Right. Um, complicated question. So the integration testing packages from various channels. So Conda Forge um, has a, a very well-developed process for testing all of the packages that are available via the Conda Forge channel to make sure that they're using the same compiler tool chains and that you will get a, um, a collection of packages that is guaranteed to be, you know, guaranteed to be good and to work. And the way that you control this is through something called uh, channel priority, which is covered in the channels and packages episode, which um, hopefully we'll get to. Uh, depending on time, we may skip that to cover the GPU, uh, the GPU material. Um, but you control this via controlling your channel priority. So if you set Conda Forge as generally the highest priority channel, not always, but generally, um, then Conda Forge does integration testing with all of the packages that are listed on their channel to make sure that they are mutually compatible. Um, the next question, yes, that's true. Uh, if you don't specify the version number, Conda will install the latest version that is compatible with all the other packages requirement. Um, Conda does not interact with system installs. Um, that's one of the key things about Conda is that once you install Conda, it has its own version of Python that is separate from the system Python. Um, it's always a good idea to never touch your system Python um, it's there to manage your operating system and do stuff for your operating system. Let it do its job. Install a separate version of Python and uh, at a minimum, have a separate version of Python that you use for your project. Um, okay, so that was my five minute timer. So I'll keep kind of trying to clear out these questions as we take small breaks. Um, and I will go back to screen sharing and uh, and we'll talk about this exercise. Okay, so the, the first part of this exercise was to install Dask, but we wanted to install it into the machine learning environment. So, um, 
at present, my SciPy environment is the one that's activated. So I need to do conda uh, deactivate. And then I need to do conda activate machine learning environment. Okay. And now I want to do uh, conda install dask. Okay. Uh, so you can see when I'm installing Dask that there's some other stuff that's getting picked up. So there's here's Dask and Dask Core and some other things. Um, Bokeh uh, is actually a visualization, uh, interesting visualization library that's worth uh, worth following. So I tried to put links. I'm not bringing them all up, but I, I really tried to you know put links to plug all these awesome uh, Python libraries and projects that I use in my own work. There's kind of littered throughout the um, uh, the course materials. So if you're unfamiliar with any of these packages and I, I don't explicitly pull up the website, you know, please take a look um, because they're all interesting projects. So Dask in particular is a project for um, parallelizing and scaling up data science workflows to run um, on multiple nodes across the cluster, basically. Okay, so now we've installed Dask. Um, and now the next, the next exercise is about using pip. Um, so now we're going to use pip to install, uh, combo. And so now we just do, uh, pip install combo. And because we had previously installed um, pip in our uh, machine learning environment. The uh, the pip inside this environment is the one that is going to be used to install uh, combo. Okay. And so now we're done. And so here, what you can see, so this it looks a bit different than what we had been seeing. So this is what pips, uh, the pip install uh, logs look like. So combo depends on number. So it went and installed uh, an older, or it requires a, at least an older version of number. Um, and then some other things that weren't already installed. Um, but when you run pip inside of an active conda environment, it will see all of these dependencies um, that are already installed. So you see these requirements already satisfied. So that's because uh, scikit-learn, scipy, Kiwi Solver, these packages were already installed via Conda in the previous step when we created the environment. And so PIP's not going to reinstall them. Okay, so that's basically it. So that's the first example of how to use PIP with Conda. Okay, so we've talked about how to create environments, how to activate, um, deactivate environments, how to install packages into an existing environment. So now, about what about where do Conda environments live? Um, so on most systems, um, environments created by Conda uh, will live uh, inside the mini Conda or Anaconda uh, directory, which is inside of your home directory. Um, so for example, normally if you were to, uh, list your home directory, um, then inside the home directory, you would usually have, uh, a mini Conda three or an Anaconda three, uh, directory. And then inside that would be a slash ENVS directory. And inside that would be all of your, um, um, would be all of your Conda environments. But on Binder, Conda is actually installed as root. And so it lives in a slightly different location. So if we want to see our Conda environments that we've been creating in Binder, if we list uh, this slightly cryptic path, we'll see the, no the environments that we've created. So here's our basic SciPy environment, our machine learning environment, 
then the notebook was one that existed. It was created by Binder and then Python 3.6 and then Python 3. And since Conda environments are just directories, we could actually look at what's inside the um, machine learning environment. <clears throat> and see, here you can see kind of the, the directory structure of, uh, of an environment. And if we do the same thing on a different environment, so the basic SciPy environment, you'll see that um, there are some common, uh, a lot of commonalities and there are some differences and the actual commonalities and, dependent, and differences depend on, you know, exact, to some degree on which packages are installed and things like that and what, what kind of additional things come with the package. Um, okay, so this is the default location. Um, so what if we want to specify a location for our Conda environment? So in order to specify a location for a Conda environment, we create, when we create the environment, we use the dash dash prefix flag as opposed to the dash dash name flag. So um, here's an example. So let's see where we are. So we are in our introduction to Conda directory. This is our working directory for the day. So if I wanted to create um, a Conda environment in a directory, Conda prefix, and I want to, to create a directory called env, and I want to create it in my current working directory. So I can do dot, which is on, um, on uh, Linux systems is a reference to the current working directory slash env. So that's basically the path to the con environment that I'm going to create. And now we can just list the things that we want. We can put high Python, um, matplotlib, pandas, Python, something like this. <clears throat> I uh, that is the error message that you get when you type the command uh, and leave out the most important parts. So conda create. <clears throat> and so now I'm going to just pop open this file pane here because in a minute you're going to see a directory called env get created inside of our current working directory. I will say yes. <clears throat> and so now inside this env directory, that same kind of directory structure that I showed you quickly um, it, that existed within the environments that were stored in the default location <clears throat> now exists inside this env directory. So if we click on the env directory, we have this bin directory for binaries, lib for libraries, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so we've now created the Conda environment, but we we specified exactly where we want that directory to be. And um, now the only difference is that when we want to activate that directory or activate that environment. So first, I'm going to deactivate. Um, the machine learning environment. But now if I want to activate an environment that I created via with the prefix, I now have to pass pass in the <clears throat> um, the path to the directory that I want to or to the conda environment I want to activate. So conda activate dot slash env. Yeah. And so now I've activated that conda environment that I just created. <clears throat> now um, I, I always do this. I don't create environments by name. I always create an environment in a, in a subdirectory called EMV of my project directory. I do this uh, for a few reasons. So one is uh, project isolation and encapsulization. So by creating the Conda environment inside a directory of my project directory, then 
once I'm inside my project directory, my entire software stack is right there with me. So I don't have to go hunting for it on my, my computer somewhere. I know exactly where it is. It's always in the same place. It's always in the slash EMV directory in my project. Um, if for whatever reason I was going to, you know, uh, zip up or, uh, tar up my whole project directory, then I would capture all of my software stack along with it. Uh, if I wanted to do that. So everything is right there inside the project. Um, uh, the other reason, um, for, uh, so that's, that's basically why, um, I always install, um, as a prefix, uh, EMV for all of my, my Conda environments. Um, the reason that I choose EMV and not some other name is that, um, I work with Git a lot, um, and Git is all automatically configured to ignore for Python projects environments that are or folders that have VMV um, or ENV, which are kind of naming conventions that are used in the virtual environment community within Python. And so that means that my the Conda directory will automatic my Conda environment directory will automatically be ignored and will not be version controlled which is what you want. So in the next episode, we're going to see how to create environment files. And those are those text files are what you version control. And you just ignore um, from a version control perspective, the contents of your environment directory. Okay. Um, so uh, there's an exercise that in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to, uh, uh, go ahead and skip over. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise. Um, oh, but no, that's a good one because we're going to install TensorFlow. So no. Okay. So I'm going to take a, um, uh, a short, just a short three minute break and have you work on this exercise, uh, creating a new environment as a subdirectory within a project directory. So that is, um, is this one. Um, and in this uh, um, in this exercise, you'll need to create a directory called project directory, and then use the command that I just showed you to create uh, an environment in a directory inside that directory, and then install Python, Matplotlib, uh, TensorFlow, and pip. And so you'll an example of installing uh, TensorFlow with, with Conda. So if we take uh, uh, two or three minutes to just look at that exercise and then I'll go back and check questions. Um, one uh, suggestion was if you could try to shorten your uh, prompt in your notebook because it, it takes up a lot of the screen. Ah, shorten the prompt. Okay. Um, let me... Vu provided uh, some sample, like a sample way to do that um, in the chat. All right. Okay. Well, let me, oh, I see. This is a bit of bash uh, magic that I am unfamiliar with. So let's, uh, let's test this out. I will test it out while I'm not screen sharing, just in case. That shortened it a little bit. And, uh, mm, no, that didn't seem to shorten it a lot. The really long thing is the the host name. So if Vu has some magic that would get rid of the username or host name, that I think would would work. Okay. So now I've broken my own terminal, so I'll have to get a new terminal. Okay. 
Okay. So that two minutes went, went quickly. Let me just, um, okay. Is it necessary to do the Conda deactivate step? If so, why? Um, I think technically not. Um, it's, uh, I, a kind of a habit that I developed um, and just kind of now continue to do. But if you continue, if you just continue to activate without deactivating, then what will happen is you will definitely accumulate cruft on your system path. You'll have this like nested. You, whenever you activate an environment, you prepend the path to that environment to your system path. And if you don't deactivate it, then it's never removed. And so, if you activate another environment from within a conda environment, it will prepend the path to that new and that environment. And so now you'll have two conda environment paths prepended to your path and so on and so forth. So I would uh, encourage you to try to remember to deactivate your environment um, after when you're done, just as a good habit to, to get into. Um, so is there a way to do a kind of search that returns only versions compatible with existing environment packages? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you can try conda search uh, dash dash help and see what is returned there. I know that the, it supports a lot of pattern matching and wildcard expansions and things like that that you can use for searching, but I don't know if it has a, um, it has a way to, to check that. Um, and no, if you want the most current version, then you don't have to specify a version number. Um, uh, I specify version numbers more to make sure that I know exactly what I'm installing. Um, but you don't need to do that. You will always get the most recent mutually compatible version. Uh, Ah, um, so when creating an environment, the packages will have, you know, typically major dot minor dot patch version. Do you need the number after the second dot? So uh, if you want to, the, the more numbers you put, the more specific you're being with Conda about your environment constraint. I typically specify the major dot the minor version number and that's it. And I allow Conda the freedom to pick up the most recent patch version that is compatible in part because the patch versions usually don't include anything except like bug fixes or things like that. Um, and I found that it's sometimes useful to give Conda a little bit of freedom to choose. And so by specifying major dot minor versions, that's, that to me has been the sweet spot for, um, pinning down Conda environment package version. <clears throat> um, can you use both name and prefix? Uh, so no, I think you need to specify one, uh, one or the other. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to go back to screen sharing. And just a logistics point. So we're coming up on about halfway through the, the, the tutorial. Is that right, um, Mike or Laurie? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it ends in two hours and 15 minutes. Okay, cool. So then in about 15 minutes would be a good time to take a, a more extended break, I think. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back to sharing screen. Um, okay. And then, <clears throat> and then let's go back to Right. Where am I? Uh, okay. So the exercise that we want to do is this, uh, this 
uh, TensorFlow uh, environment. So I'm going to <clears throat> uh, make a directory, and I'll call it uh, TensorFlow project. And then I'll CD into this TensorFlow project. <clears throat> and now I want to create a new environment inside this directory. So I'm going to do const create prefix. Um, and I'll try multi-line uh, commands to see if that, uh, that helps. So conda create dash dash prefix, um, except I should have conda create Um, there's a short dash P for prefix. So I'm going to create it in the environment subdirectory. And now let's list out the things that I want to install. So I want to install Python 3.6. Nope. The, the perils of, uh, I'll try the multi-line approach one more time. P, the thing with multi-line commands is that you have to remember the slash after each line or Bash will rightly think that you're done typing. So Python 3.6 slash, uh, then we want Matt, plot lib 31 slash uh, tensorflow 21 and then pip because we always install pip in our Python in our conda environments and now we're going to leave off the slash so hopefully that makes the command maybe a little bit more legible and I'll have to figure out how to uh, um, shorten this up, shorten up the prompt for future versions of this. Okay. So now Conda is going off and trying to find uh, Python, Matplotlib, TensorFlow, and PIP with those version numbers um, to install. Okay. And there we go. So I'll say yes. And so you can see just looking up here at, at some of the packages that um, that were needed. Um, so TensorFlow has quite a lot of dependencies. So you can see, so here's Keras, um, uh, a couple of Keras packages. So Keras is a, is a nice front end for, uh, for TensorFlow um, that tries to simplify a lot of deep learning, the boilerplate, required for deep learning training. And then we get TensorFlow, some te TensorFlow base and estimator packages, the TensorBoard, which is a package for um, monitoring the progress of your deep learning neural network training. Um, and as an aside, while this is installing things, you'll see if you look at uh, this TensorFlow here, um, it is TensorFlow 2.1.0-MKL. So this is a CPU only version of TensorFlow that has been um, built with uh, Intel's math kernel library, MKL uh, linear algebra routine. Um, so that makes it uh, quite efficient from a CPU only, for a CPU only version of TensorFlow. And it's done. Um, so then if we did uh, conda activate. Okay, so now we have this, um, we've activated our environment. Uh, 
and just to clear. And if we did um, uh, Python, and if we did import uh, TensorFlow as TF. Oh. TensorFlow has no attribute compact. Well, that's a bit of a bust. Uh, hmm. I was not expecting that at all. So, how to debug that? Well, what we can do is I'll make a note of that, and then when we delete an environment later, maybe we'll, we'll cover how to delete this environment and start over. Because clearly something did not work as intended. Um, okay, so we will deactivate this environment. And and move on. Okay, so there have been several questions, and now I'm going to skip down a little bit to listing existing environments, um, because there have been several questions about, well, how do I keep track of all the environments that I'm creating? So uh, there's kind of a subcommand called conda env, so short for conda environment list. And this command will list all of the environments that you've created. Um, so in particular, we have, uh, so there's this notebook environment, which we didn't actually create, but was created via Conda by uh, Binder, um, and a star next to it, indicating that that's the active environment. And you can see that from the prompt because it has the notebook environment here. And then these other environments are ones that generally ones that we created. So we created the basic SciPy environment by name, uh, Python 3 environment, Python 3.6 environment, and they were all installed to this default location, slash SRV, slash Conda, slash MVS. So this is the default location on, um, on Binder. And then we have these other two, which have this blank here. So these are the environments that were created via prefix, and we prefix them to be installed into um, the first one we created was just into an EMV directory inside our intro to Conda directory. And then the second one we created was inside this TensorFlow project uh, directory. And so they don't have any names, so that's why there's a blank here. Um, but it creates the path to those environments. So that's how that, this, will, this command gives you the list of all the Conda environments that have been installed. Okay. Now, um, if you want to um, list the contents of a Conda directory, like what packages have been installed in that directory, there's another command called uh, Conda list. And then you can either provide the name um, of the environment, like basic uh, SciPy environment. And now this lists the details of all the packages that are installed. So these are all of our packages with the, the name, the version number, the build number, uh, and the channel. And we'll talk more about build and, uh, well, since we might not have time to cover the packages and channels episode or lesson, the build numbers are um, the very unique things that the, the name, the version number, and the build number uniquely determine um, a Python or a Conda package from a particular channel specified via the, the last column, the channel. So most of these are coming from Conda Forge. Um, and so in here, so here's matplotlib, uh, there's numpy, and then we were, afterwards we installed numba, so there was numba, um, and then we installed scikit-learn later, and then scipy was included when we created the environment. And then all of the dependencies of all of these packages. Um, 
if you want to list the contents of a conda environment that you created via prefix, then you just do conda list uh, prefix and then the path to the environment. So env. And so again, the reason keeping a consistent naming convention for your conda environments in your project allows you to just use the same commands over and over again. So no matter what project I'm in, I can always list the contents of my conda environment with the same command, conda list prefix environment dot or dot slash env. And so this is this TensorFlow one, which did, which created, but then there's something not quite right um, in the TensorFlow that was installed. Um, David, sorry to interrupt. People have been saying in chat that it proves to be a problem uh, in TensorFlow. Um, well, they think it should be solved in 2.1. Um, and I guess that's what you have. Yeah, that's what I installed. So um, I kind of thought that it wasn't actually a conda issue, that it was something going on in TensorFlow that was, that was problematic. Um, but uh, I'm a bit surprised. We did install version TensorFlow or TensorFlow 2.1. That's not the most recent version of TensorFlow. Um, so maybe one way we could fix it is um, since some users or some learners brought this up. So let's uh, let's see how we could. Well, we'll fix it in a minute. Um, or we'll try to install TensorFlow 2.2 and see if that fixes the, <coughs> uh, fixes the problem. Because um, I've noticed, for example, that for some reason it installed Estimator 2.2, but TensorFlow 2.1, which I find suspicious. But um, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, OK, so I want to cover so deleting, uh, deleting environments, and then we're going to take a a 15 minute break, uh, I think, and then, and then we'll come back. So um, deleting environments. So I often delete environments that I'm no longer using because I can always recreate them again uh, if I need to, um, just to kind of keep things neat and tidy. Um, but you know, if you don't want to delete your environment, that's OK, too. Um, so, but if you do want to delete an environment, so there are two ways to do it. So the command is conda remove. Um, and then once you type conda remove, then you pass dash the name. And then if you name the environment, um, you can remove. And I found a, mis uh, a typo in my teaching notes. Um, the command in the teaching notes has conda remove dash dash name my first conda environment. Uh, but my first conda environment doesn't exist because I changed it to uh, basic scipy environment. So let's just remove the basic scipy environment, which is actually what's asked in the exercise. So if we do basic uh, scipy environment, um, and then dash dash all and the dash dash all is important in order if you want to completely remove the environment. Um, so if don't forget about the dash dash all, um, if we, if we had created an environment via prefix, then instead of the dash dash name, we would just use dash dash prefix and then the name. So I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So we'll remove this. And I'll just say yes, which is confirms everything. And um, that's it. We're done. So it removed that environment. So now if we did conda env list, there's no more basic sci-fi environment. It has gone away. Um, but we still see our machine learning environment. Now, let's, uh, let's get rid of our troublesome TensorFlow environment that didn't seem to work as expected. So we can do conda uh, remove uh, prefix, and then the path, which is again just dot slash env dash dash all, and I'll put dash dash yes just so I don't confirm. <clears throat> 
most of the conda commands have this dash dash yes flag, which just executes the command without asking you, are you sure you want to do this? Okay. And so now again, if I do conda env list, then that TensorFlow environment is gone. Okay. So let's take, uh, so just to sum up, and then we'll take a 15 minute break. So we have covered all of the basics in this episode of how to use Conda. So uh, we talked about how to create and remove directories. We talked about how to, or sorry, how to create and um, remove Conda environments. And Conda environments themselves are really just directories uh, in your file system. That we then talked about how to activate and deactivate environments using that conda activate, conda act deactivate command. Uh, we installed packages into existing conda environments using conda install. Um, and we even saw an example of how to use pip in conjunction with conda to install a package that wasn't available via a conda channel. Um, I mentioned that I encourage you to create environments as subdirectories inside the corresponding project directory, just so you have nice encapsul encapsulization and isolation of your project software stack with the source code for that project. Um, and then we covered the command conda env list and then conda list, um, which are commands to, in the first case, list existing environments. Um, and in the second case, the conda list command lists all packages installed in an environment. Um, and again, all of this is, is covered in the, uh, in the lecture notes. Okay. David, thank so, you. Um, we have a request in chat. Can you type history and just leave your screen up during the break so people can see um, what you've done? Uh, I sure can. Thanks. Um, but this is not going to probably give the complete history. Yeah. <laughs> so this won't give the complete history of all the commands I typed because I when I in the in my attempt to shorten my uh, prompt, I somehow screwed up my prompt in my terminal, so I had to close that terminal. So unfortunately, you will not get the complete history of commands that I've typed. Apologies, but this, that's okay. That's great. Okay, um, and I might play around over the break and see if I can fix that TensorFlow project. But for those of you who want a, a challenge. What I was going to do was recreate the TensorFlow environment, but just uh, remove the version number on TensorFlow to allow it to pick up the most recent version of TensorFlow and see if that fixed the problem, which suggests, if it does, that suggests it's an issue with TensorFlow version 2.1. Um, but that was where I was going to start. So anyway, so let's take a 15 minute break. So we'll come back at, um, well, for me, it would be 5.20 in the afternoon, but for you all, it would be 11.20? I don't know if I've got my time zones right, but we'll take a 15-minute break. Yeah, you do. That's the right time zone. <laughs> okay. Um, but I will... Uh, I'll take a quick glance at the questions, too, just to see what's accumulating there. Oh, can you put your screen back with the history or at some point? Oh, shoot. Um, yes, I'll do that. I'll just leave the, the, the looking at the questions until later. So I forgot okay. someone had asked about that. So let's... Um, uh, oh. I, have I somehow... Ah, there we go. Okay. I had gotten rid of my own screen. Okay, so sharing and then JupyterLab. Okay, cool. So I'll leave this here. Um, and then I'll be back in a little bit. Okay, so we seem to be good to go. We're back on time. Um, so let's um, ease back into things. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and we're just going to talk about kind of the uh, agenda for the rest of the tutorial. So Okay. So I'm going to go up for Okay, so what
what have we done? So we have covered uh, getting started with Conda and working with environment. And so that leaves us with uh, a little under two hours and um, three episodes to cover. So what I think we're going to do is um, we're definitely going to cover sharing environments because that is, uh, as I said earlier, you know, episodes two and three are the bulk of, of the core content of this tutorial. So we're definitely going to cover all of episode three. Uh, episode four, I am likely to um, quickly talk through that episode um, and just kind of hit the highlights, but probably not really do a deep dive into any of that uh, content because I do want to give uh, good attention to the GPU dependencies uh, episode because I think that's one of the major advantages uh, of Conda over other tools that I have, I have used. And, and also maybe highly relevant for you because many of you might be pursuing uh, machine learning or deep learning projects that uh, rely on GPUs and need to know how to get started uh, quickly with your you know, GPU projects. So, um, okay, so without further ado, let's go ahead and skip ahead to sharing environments. Okay, so in this episode, we're going to talk about why you might want to share your Conda environment with others. And then we're going to talk about the, the mechanics of how you actually do that. So how do you share your Conda environment with others? Um, and then in answering to a number of questions that came up earlier, we're going to see how to create a custom kernel for a Conda environment inside of Jupyter Lab. Um, this is a, a bit of an odd duck in this episode, but it had to fit in somewhere because it's, uh, um, it's an important little topic. Um, so the objectives are to uh, we're going to show how you can create an environment from a YAML file, and so that you uh, can give that environment file, share it with your peers or colleagues, and have them be able to recreate your Conda environment on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, and then we're going to see how to create an environment uh, file based on exact uh, package versions, uh, and then we'll see how to create again a custom kernel for a Conda environment for use inside Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so here we go. So working with environment files. Um, <clears throat> so when you're working on a, uh, on a research project, it's very often the case that your operating system might differ in important ways from the operating systems of your collaborators. So you might run, you might have Mac or Windows and they might have the opposite or you might have, you know, um, someone on your team that runs Linux and then everyone else has Mac and Windows. So um, how are you going to easily share your Conda environments um, as a group? Uh, or similarly, you know, you might be a Mac or Windows user on your local machine or, uh, or local laptop or workstation, um, but then your university's uh, remote computing cluster runs Linux, or you want to trans uh, transition your work to AWS or GCP, and those platforms also run Linux generally. Um, uh, so how are we going to do that efficiently? And there was a, in our earlier discussion about, um, about some of the costs and benefits of project specific software environments. Um, you know, someone brought up the issue of porting an entire environment and that if your environment is really large, you know, how portable is it? And um, we, I mentioned at the time that we were going to talk about an environment file, which is going to be just a text file that was a specification of your environment. And it's that specification file that you were going to actually uh, share or port to uh, another, uh, another computer and then recreate, rebuild the Conda environment based on that specification on that other machine. And that's what we're going to learn in this episode. So the first thing that we need to talk about is how to create a Conda environment file. So um, Conda environment files are written in a, a markup language called YAML, which YAML actually stands for YAML ain't markup language, uh, but it kind of is a markup language really, um, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, so the idea with YAML is that it's supposed to be 
um, human readable, but still structured enough that it can be serialized, um, which makes it efficiently machine readable. Uh, that's at least the idea. Um, so like Python, um, uh, indentation in YAML files is important and white space is important. <clears throat> um, so uh, when you are uh, creating your uh, conduit environment, uh, early, well, I would say that creating a conduit environment uh, from a single environment file is a conduit best practice. So I, the commands that we, we've been learning are kind of like the basic commands that are good for kind of prototyping uh, a conduit environment quickly and getting up and running with the project. But for any of my kind of production work, uh, or any time I sit down to work with, um, you know, with a collaborator at Kaust, um, I always write up an environment file for the work that we're doing. And then I always build my content environment based on that environment file, because the environment file is going to give me a complete specification of everything that I need uh, to rebuild the environment. So I can, you know, um, I always have a way to rebuild the environment <clears throat> from the environment file. Okay. Um, by default, the con naming convention for uh, and called environment files is unsurprisingly environment.yml. Um, you can, of course, cr call your environment file whatever you want, um, but I tend to stick with the default convention. Um, so let's take a look at an example. So um, uh, in the teaching notes, so here is a conda environment file for um, the machine learning environment that we created earlier, at least the, the bare bones version that we created earlier. So we have uh, a key name, colon, and then the machine learning environment, which is the kind of the value associated with that. Um, and then we've got a key dependencies and then kind of a list of values, uh, which correspond to the uh, Python or the conda packages, which we would like to install into our environment. And that's it. So it's very human readable, fairly simple, um, but yet still uh, structured enough uh, that we can, uh, that we can use it um, or that a machine can serialize it and then, and then use it. Um, so here's another example of the same. So I tend to not name my environments because I create them via prefix. So I often just put null in as the name. Um, but you do have to start your environment file with name, colon, and then something. So um, I tend to put just null. Uh, the other thing that I tend to do is specify, again, package numbers or uh, package version numbers. So uh, my way of writing this environment file for the machine learning environment would look like this third example. So the name would be null, and then I would put major dot minor version numbers specified for all of the um, <clears throat> all of the Python packages that I want to install in my conduit environment. Okay, so another best practice. So always version control your environment files. So um, if you're always version controlling your environment file, uh, you can always go back to a previous version of your environment file. Um, although there are some more advanced ways, advanced conda tricks um, that I'm not going to cover today that will al that also allow you to rebuild environments based on history, environment history. Um, but another way to do it is just version control your environment.yaml file, and then you can always go back to some previous version, um, assuming that you pin your version numbers. Um, you don't want to version control your environment subdirectory. So that's why if you keep to the convention of your environment subdirectory being env, then it's automatically going to be ignored by git and you don't have to worry about accidentally version controlling and then trying to push all of your the contents of your environment file up to git and creating havoc with uh, git and github. Um, you don't need to version control your environment subdirectory because as long as you have your environment file, then you can always recreate the contents of that uh, environment directory. <clears throat> so, um, so let's see how we would actually use this. Um, so let's. I'm just going to copy uh, 
the third version of this uh, environment file. And we're going to uh, go over to JupyterLab. And instead of TensorFlow, um, I'm going to uh, make another directory and I'll call this uh, scikit-learn uh, environment. <laughs> And then if I uh, CD into my scikit-learn environment, and now <clears throat> I need to create uh, a file. So if I go over, um, you know, if you're experienced at doing uh, text editing from the command line, there are ways that you can use uh, text editors from the command line uh, to do that. But I'm just going to do uh, via Jupyter. I'm just going to use the, the file manager. Uh, to navigate to my scikit-learn environment. And then I am going to uh, create a new text file. And I will paste the contents of that. <clears throat> and then I will, uh, you can do a right click and rename file. And I will call this in, environment.yaml, YML, uh, check my spelling, and hit enter. Okay. And now that that's done, I can save it. And you can see there's some nice syntax highlighting here in JupyterLab. YAML is one of the uh, markup languages that JupyterLab has native syntax, native support for syntax highlight, highlighting. And that, that's it. So now we've got our environment file. And now we can go back here. And the command is similar, but a little bit different for creating an environment from a, uh, from an environment file. It's conda space EMV. You have to use the EMV subcommand. Create, and then we're going to create by prefix. And then with that file. So I'm just going to copy that file name. So I'm just going to copy that and um, paste it and hit enter. <clears throat> and the most common error that I run into when I do this is that I either misspell environment, um, either uh, I misspell environment when I created the file or I misspell it here when I type it in. <clears throat> but it looks like I haven't made either of those mistakes. Um, but now at this point, Conda is doing the exact same thing that it was doing earlier. It's just, it's parsed the environment.yaml file, extracted the, the dependencies and the version numbers, and is now just going through its same, collect the metadata for all the packages, check the version numbers, set up this satisfiability problem based on the constraints implied by those version numbers, and then finding a solution to that problem in the form of packages and version numbers that satisfy all the constraints. <clears throat> And it's this part that can sometimes take a long time, depending on the hardware on which you're building the environment and the complexity of the environment. And um, someone asked about Mamba earlier. Um, one of the uh, major things that Mamba has done is to have a solver that dramatically speeds up the solving process. At least that's the big selling point of Mamba right now. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, and so there we go. Uh, and so at this point, so uh, so if you notice here again, our environment subdirectory was created. Um, I'm just going to clear this so we can activate the directory and then we could do uh, a conda list in that directory to see kind of what uh, what was installed so here's our scikit learn um, we have python 3.6 there's pip pandas NumPy, 
So it looks like everything's there. Okay. Um, okay. So there's one um, in the in the lecture notes. There's a, uh, a kind of a bit of a warning about the, beware the conda emv export command. So. <clears throat> Um, one question that often comes up is like, okay, David, so I created my Conda environment using Conda create, I installed a bunch of stuff. Uh, then I went and installed a bunch of more packages. Um, then I updated some things and installed some more packages. I have no idea what I've done. How can I get my Conda environment file? <clears throat> and the answer to that is, well, there's a export command for that. So if you do, <clears throat> excuse me, Conda, uh, I'll clear this first. Conda EMV export, uh, and then the name <clears throat> for the prefix. In this case, I'll do the prefix of the environment that you want to export. <laughs> and <clears throat> there we go. So that what that did was it um, just return to the terminal a correctly YAML formatted environment file um, for the environment that we just created. Notice that a couple of things about this environment file. So notice it has way more stuff than what we actually specified. So what we specified were kind of like our, our core dependencies. And then we let Conda figure out all the other dependencies that were actually needed to make up our environment. Here, Conda with the EMV export command is giving us everything that's in the environment, including how it was installed. So there is even some three things that were installed via pip that we didn't even know about. Um, um, and we're providing the version, the major, minor, and patch version, and then the build number. So very, very, very specific. This, this environment file is. Um, if we wanted to uh, redirect that, we could use some bash uh, magic to redirect the output of this file to, um, I'll call this exported environment.yaml. And so now instead of, um, Instead of just putting the, the contents back into the terminal, um, yeah, over here now we have this exported environment. And so here's our exported environment. And so this all looks well and good. And you think, okay, this is fantastic. Um, and it's really good for sharing, um, sharing environments on the same operating system. So there is loads of packages in here and build numbers that correspond to things that are Linux specific. And so if you try to give this exported environment file to a colleague that runs Windows or Mac, it would fail and it wouldn't build properly uh, because some of these packages and these build numbers do not exist for other operating systems. They're Linux specific. Um, if you gave, if you created an environment file from the beginning, this will work uh, on Windows, Mac, and Linux. But this will probably only work on Linux. Now, there's another flag that you can add to make it slightly less, um, to basically drop the build numbers. So if I change this to uh, no builds, and then I'll go up here and add, um, is it dash dash no builds option? <clears throat> this will generate uh, a third environment file, which is the same as this one, except there's no build numbers. So you notice how the build numbers have just dropped out. So this only has the version number. So this is less specific. So this has a better chance of working maybe on Mac, but I would still venture to bet that there is some stuff packages in here that are actually Linux specific packages uh, that because we built this environment on Linux and the export command exports everything, 
even OS specific stuff, it makes it hard to give this environment file to someone who's running Mac or Windows and have them rebuild it. So that's the reason for the warning is that <clears throat> yes, you can always extract an environment file from an existing Conda environment, but it might not be as portable as you would like. And so the way to avoid this problem is always create an environment file from the beginning of your project. Even if it doesn't have specific um, environment numbers or version numbers um, pinned down from the beginning, uh, you can start with an environment file that just lists, uh, I don't know, a handful of your core dependencies that you want without version numbers. And then you can put in version numbers later as you get closer to finishing the project. Um, <clears throat> but the way that I, the way this, this environment file is specified, I could share this with you know, a colleague that runs Windows and they could rebuild this environment. For Windows, I could share it with somebody who's on Mac. They could rebuild it for Mac. I could take it to another Linux uh, environment and it would work. Um, it's much less constrained than this, which is very constrained. Now, if I wanted to, if I was working on my, on, you know, with a bunch of colleagues in the same environment in the cloud or with the colleagues at my, on my university cluster where we all have the same operating system, then the easiest way for me to share my environment is to use the conda export command. Because now I'm being very specific about what I'm using. There's no ambiguity in packages or, or, or build numbers or anything. But that only really works when you are all sharing the same operating system environment. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm sure there'll be questions about that later. So in fact, now's a good time for a short break to look at an exercise. So in the, um, uh, in the notes, there is a create a new environment from a YAML file. So this is your chance to practice what we've just done. Um, so I would like you to create um, uh, a new project directory. Now you can call it XG Boost project, for example. Um, and then I would like you to create an environment in the subdirectory um, from this environment file. And you notice that this environment file is very similar to the one we just used. Um, it might have some different version numbers, except I've included this uh, XG, Boost, <clears throat> XG Boost package. So um, if you could have a go at that. Uh, in the meantime, I'll switch back and take a look at what questions have accumulated. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <clears throat> and I will take a look now at what questions have accumulated. And also, Hey, David, one question that came up was, is there any way to automatically update the YAML file as you change your environment? Is there any service that does that? Do you know? Um, automatically update your environment file. Um, that is a good question. I don't think so. Um, at least, well, I shouldn't say I don't think so. I mean, sometimes you, there's so much work being done out there that you feel like there surely there must exist a service that does thing X. Um, but I've not looked for that, um, in part because I tend to be a bit picky about controlling my own version, my controlling my own environment files, because that's like the one thing that about the whole conda process that's really important for me. So if I um, if I make some substantial kind of updates or change some install or have some new packages or something. Um, and I wasn't already using an environment file, I, I would just go ahead and export the environment file and um, update it in my version control system and kind of manually maintain it because that helps me keep more of, uh, I mean, the cost, the, the maintenance, in my experience, the manual maintenance cost of doing that yourself is pretty low um, once you get over the, the kind of learning curve of, of using Conda. And the benefits to having better visibility on exactly what's going on are pretty high, I think. So I'm not sure I would want to turn that over to an automated service. <clears throat> but it looks like somebody tossed a link into the chat that is similar. 
at least for uh, for PIP. All right, so let's see what we have in the questions. Okay. So is Conda aware of PIP installed packages, i.e. will it stop you removing packages PIP use as dependencies? Um, so Michael comments ish. So yeah, so as a Conda interoperability with Conda and PIP, um, between Conda and PIP is it kind of is, is something that the Conda developers and maintainers keep a close eye on and they do try to make sure that it works as seamlessly as possible. Um, and in my experience, it works really well, but um, there are always uh, kind of rough edges. Um, how do you specify the environment you want your Python program to use? Can you do this from within the program? Um, right. Okay, so one way in which I do something like this is, um, uh, so at Calst, we have access to a, um, a computing cluster, or two clusters really, um, that are managed via Slurm. And so when I submit a job to our cluster, as part of my job submission script, of course, I have to say like, well, what Conda environment am I using? Do I want to use? And the way that I usually handle that is in my bash script, which gets submitted um, to the cluster, I'll have a CD, which CDs into the directory containing the Python or containing the Conda environment, like my project directory basically changed to my project directory and then Conda activate dot slash EMV. So the same two commands change to my project directory, activate the Conda environment in that subdirectory and then do whatever I'm doing. Um, and I manage those, those job submission scripts via version control using Git, GitHub, things like that. Uh, oh, okay, good question. So when you set up your environments uniquely uh, um, for each project, like I've been advocating that you do, does that take up more memory than having them all stored in the same place? Um, and I believe that the answer is no, um, because uh, Conda uh, will still do the caching and it will still manage everything, but it does things via um, via hard links um, in the background. Okay. Um, So does Conda remove also remove dependencies of the remove packages that aren't used by any other package? Um, okay, so if you do Conda, I didn't talk about this, um, removing a, a particular package. So there is a command, uh, an option called, um, I believe it's dash dash prune, um, so that when you remove um, a package, it will also go through and remove any unused dependencies of that package. So like these would be kind of just dangling dependencies that are no longer relevant in your environment because you remove the package for which they were dependent. Um, so you can do that. The reason that I didn't really cover that is that I, I tend to just blow away entire Conda environments and recreate them because I have rather than update or install into like, I just, I have my environment file and I just, add things to my environment file as I go. And then if I want to update the environment, I just recreate the environment from scratch. So basically I have the conda uh, emv create command, the conda activate command, the conda remove all command. That's basically it. That way I, I only have like three commands I have to keep track of. And, um, and for me, the environment creation process for conda is not a binding constraint. Um, you know, it's only order of minutes for the environments that I've been creating, and it's not really pushed me 
to have to worry too much about, well, if, my, if the environment creation was taking only order of hours for some reason, um, then, uh, then you might have to start looking at other, other options. But I just tend to delete my, remove my entire environment and recreate it from scratch. Okay. Um, now I'm going to so go back. I'm going to start sharing my screen again. And we'll take a look at that, uh, that exercise. Okay. So I am just going to copy, shamelessly copy and paste. So I'll go back to my introduction to Conda. And in JupyterLab, you can also just right click a uh, new folder. And I will call this um, XG Boost pro uh, Project. And I will go in here. I guess I should get rid of all these other files. And I will create a new file. Uh, and I will call that uh, right click, uh, where is it? Rename. And then I will paste the contents of the environment file. And let's clear out this madness. And I will do a con deactivate. So I'll deactivate the environment that I'm in just to be tidy. Okay. And now I need to, uh, so I'll CD, go home. And now I will change into the introduction to Conda and then my XG boost project. And then in here, I see I have my environment file. So now I can do conda create, sorry, conda env create um, dash dash prefix dash slash env file environment.yaml. And um, so this is kind of churning away here. And so while this is going, I guess I ought to, so XG Boost, let's see, did I put a, a link to XG Boost? I, it looks like I did not. So while this is, uh, while this is building, So if you're not aware of the XG Boost project yeah, and you're into machine learning, then you should be. Um, so XG Boost is a library for um, fitting gradient, uh, gradient boosted, extreme gradient boosting uh, models, usually it's gradient boosted trees, but also some, some other things. It's uh, a very efficient uh, implementation. Uh, it's highly scalable, um, not just on a single node to multiple cores or multiple CPUs uh, on the node, but also across uh, multiple nodes in a cluster. It can be accelerated with uh, quite efficiently with, uh, with GPUs. Um, and it is widely used um, in industry and machine learning projects and is probably the most successful machine learning algorithm on Kaggle. Um, wins a lot of Kaggle competitions. Um, it's kind of the place where I start 
uh, when I'm doing machine learning is, you know, because it also solves both regression problems and classification problems. So, you know, whenever I start a new machine learning project, I usually, XGBoost is usually a baseline implementation that I go to. And I, I'm going to use XGBoost. I'm going to see what XGBoost comes up with. And that'll be a baseline that I will need to beat if, uh, you know, maybe deep neural networks can solve the problem more efficiently or give me a better solution, but XGBoost is a good benchmark. So um, this exercise kind of shows you how to get started and install XGBoost with Conda. Uh, and so now that you've done that, of course, if you wanted to activate this, you could do a Conda activate uh, dot slash EMV and then a Conda list. And then you can see, so here's our XGBoost. Okay. Now, updating an environment. So uh, there is a, in the, in the teaching notes, I cover two commands uh, for updating environments, only one of which I, I use in my own work. Um, uh, in the Conda documentation, they, they talk about this Conda EMV update command has the same structure as the conda env create command. You have your prefix and your file name, and then this dash dash prune option, um, uh, which does what I, I mentioned earlier, it removes any dependencies that are no longer required uh, from the environment. Um, my preference is actually just to rebuild the environment from scratch. And the uh, an, a benefit of that approach is that you've got the same command that creates the environment with a given prefix using a particular environment file, if you just add this dash dash force, then anytime you run that command, if the environment already exists, then it will just overwrite, it'll just blow away the directory and overwrite it uh, or recreate it with the new, uh, with whatever is in this environment file. So you can just, you know, if you need to add a package, you just add it to your environment file and then you run this conda environment create with the dash dash force and then it, uh, it'll just blow away the directory and recreate the environment from scratch. And for my projects and the work that I do, like I said, the environment creation process is, is typically, you know, on the order of minutes and is not, uh, I have not found it to be a binding constraint in my workflow, but this, this command, the environment update, this command is much quicker because it's doing less work. Um, so I put them both there for you to kind of choose your, uh, choose yourself. Um, but I tend to just rebuild it from scratch each time. Okay. Um, so let's take, um, let's take a couple minutes and uh, work on this exercise, so adding Dask. So what I want to do is, this is basically to practice your um, updating an environment. So you want to add Dask to your environment.yaml file that we created in the previous exercise for the XGBoost, the XGBoost environment. And then use either command, um, this update command, or the create command with the force option and update the environment so that it has uh, it now includes Dask. And so I will stop sharing. I'll set my timer and then stop sharing um, and go and check out some uh, the questions. Um, All right, so let's see what else we have in here. Well, we're just having a little bit of trouble. Some people are having trouble getting XG Boost. Um, so that's what's going on in chat. All right, okay. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Um, soft package not found. Okay, so the first thing to try, um, so this could be an for those of you who are having trouble, is it ten, are you having trouble on Binder or are you having trouble with your local install? Because if it's a local install, it could be that um, that 
version of XG Boost is not available for your operating system. So the first thing that I would try would be deleting the version, um, the version number and allow Conda to look for the most recent version number. The other is uh, spelling, so it's case sensitive. So you do need to use XG Boost all lowercase. Um, there are some other packages on there. You definitely don't want R dash XG Boost. That's XG Boost and the bindings for R. Um, the Pi dash XG Boost um, is probably another package of. There are a lot of wrappers of XG Boost that people have have put on, um, and I tried to use the one that I tend to use, which is just plain XG Boost one. Um, but the Pi XG Boost, I think, is probably going to give you the same thing. And normally, you might have to add ConduForge, but if you're in, again, if you're using Binder, then ConduForge has already been added. Um, and I did see that Laurie, I think, put in the um, uh, add dash C uh, space ConduForge to add the ConduForge channel. Um, uh, we haven't talked about channels and packages yet. That um, that version of the command is actually talked about in the next episode. Okay, so let me take a glance through the, the questions here. Ah, can I um, just delete the directory instead of doing conda remove? Um, so as Michael uh, pointed out in the comment, so yes, you can, but the, the, the problem with that is, is um, uh, so when you, when you run the conda create command, it not just, it's not, it doesn't just like create the directory and populate it with a bunch of stuff. It also adds a little bit of metadata, like it keeps track of your conda environments on your system and things like that. So if you just delete the directory, it will delete the environment, but then you'll still have like references to the environment in the in Conda because Conda will, in a sense, think that that environment is still there, uh, even though it's not. Um, so it's not going to break anything, but uh, it's probably not a good idea. It's not a good habit to uh, uh, to start, basically. Um, does the order of channels or dependencies in the YAML environment definitions file matter? So the order of dependencies does not matter. Uh, the order of channels matters a lot. Um, the order of the channels determines their priority. And I've been kind of explicitly ignoring that for now because we haven't talked about channels yet. If we we're going to talk about channels, um, there's quite a, a deep explanation in the channels and packages episode, which we're probably going to skip in the interest of time. Um, but I will talk about channels um, in the context of GPUs uh, because it comes up quite a lot in that episode. So we'll see examples of how to specify properly prioritized channels and environment files in the GPU section. What happens when you activate an environment from another activated environment? Um, so from the Conda perspective, it does kind of the, it prepends the path to the environment you're at to your system path, which then includes the path of the environment that's already active. So you'll have this like cruft build up in your, in the front of your system path. Um, and then it also runs the activation script. So it, any, <clears throat> Usually, this doesn't cause problems, but I try to be, you know, quite. Um, uh, I think it's a good habit to get into to deactivate the environment um, before you activate another one. Uh, okay, I'll do one more and then I'll get back to the, uh, uh, the notes. So in the environment, the YAML files, there's a field that lists the name and the prefix. 
If we are creating a new environment from that YAML file, do the prefix and name options from the command line overrule the YAML name? Um, so, the I don't think so. I don't think that the prefix, um, the prefix in the environment.yaml file, it gets put there. It gets put. It gets put there by the environment export command. But if you were to then create an environment with that exported environment file, the prefix and the name are kind of meaningless. The command line parameters would overwrite would override them. Um, so I think I, the answer to your the short answer to your question is yes. Um, Okay, um, and now I'm going to put those aside and I'll hop back into um, screen sharing. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so we added Dask. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip the actual solution for that. But you can see um, here, I added uh, Dask. So I did actually quite a bit more than what you would. So there's Dask, which is the core uh, Dask. And then Dask has a, a Dask ML. Um, and then there's Dask XG Boost. And I think it might be the case that if you leave off Dask ML and Dask XG Boost that they'll be installed anyway by Dask, but maybe not. Um, but this is how I would set up an environment file. And then again, I would use the dash dash force. Uh, there's a typo here. So this should be environment create with the force flag. I can note of that. Okay, so uh, the last thing that we're going to cover in this episode before we go to GPU related things is um, uh, how to make Jupyter aware of your Conda environment. So this is a question that has come up uh, <clears throat> come up quite a bit. So um, when you launch your Jupyter Lab server or your Jupyter Notebook server, um, <clears throat> you know it will. Um, you always have the standard IPython kernel that's available. Um, and then if you have a Conda environment where you've installed Jupyter uh, or Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, and then you activate that Conda environment and then launch the Jupyter Notebook server or the Jupyter Lab server from that environment, it will have access by default to everything that's installed in the environment that was active when you launched the server. But what we've been doing here on Binder is kind of a workflow where we effectively we have a default Conda environment that has the Jupyter has Jupyter Lab already installed, and we've been creating all these other environments. And now we want to, in a sense, expose those environments to Jupyter Lab so we can launch notebooks and consoles from those from those Conda environments. And so that's what uh, that's what we're going to. I'm going to show you how you do that now. So there's a package that you need in your environment in order to create basically a custom kernel for that Conda environment. And it's this IPy kernel package. So um, I'm just going to copy this IPy kernel package and I'm going to go in here and paste it into my environment file for XGBoost, save it. Um, and then uh, I'm going to deactivate my environment. And then I'm going to run that. I'm just pressing up. I'm going to run that same command again, <clears throat> except I'm just going to pass force. So I'm going to blow away the environment and recreate it. Um, to add that IPy kernel uh, package. 
And I'll go back and talk a little bit <clears throat> more about um, about uh, kernels and uh, and how this how this process works. So basically, once we once we create our conda environment that has this ipy kernel package installed, <clears throat> then then what I'm going to do is we're going to activate the environment and then we're going to run this command uh, this command here which basically uses the IPy kernel Python module as a command line tool to create um, a kernel spec file. And there's a link here to the documents, the Jupyter documents on kernel spec files. <clears throat> it's gonna create this, basically this special file um, for the active conda environment. And then once that file is created, then Jupyter Lab can become aware that that conda file exists and it can allow you to create notebooks and Python consoles from that active environment or from that environment. <clears throat> and okay, so now we're done. And I need to go back to my notes because this is a command that I haven't quite memorized yet. So I will just copy it and paste it. And Hit enter. Oh, <clears throat> but I forgot. I forgot to activate that environment first. <clears throat> Fortunately, this is not a big issue because when I run that command again, it's just going to overwrite the kernel spec file that was previously there. Okay, <clears throat> so now I have created this, um, this kernel spec file. And no, I mean, nothing happened. I mean, this, this kernel spec file was created and it was put in this particular path and you can, or this particular location. And it was put in dot local. So this is my user and binder and then dot local share Jupyter kernels actually boost MV. So there it is. So now if I go back here and I go back to my launcher screen, so now, if you remember before, there was only a single kernel here, just a single Python 3 notebook kernel and Python 3 console kernel. Now I have this kernel that I just created for XGBoost. So I can launch a notebook. And then if everything has gone well, I should be able to do import uh, XGBoost as XGB. And there we go. So, and you can see over here on your Jupyter notebook where you have your, in the top corner, you'll have this um, menu where you can select your kernel. And you can see that now that I've created this kernel spec file, um, my preferred kernel is listed as XGBoost, but it also sees that I've got this plain Python 3 kernel over here that I could, I could use if I wanted to. Uh, I'm just gonna hit cancel. Um, and I will close this and uh, go ahead and close without saving. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So the next exercise, I'll set the timer for this before we switch over, um, uh, is to give you some practice with creating a a custom kernel for a conda environment. So see if you can create a custom kernel for the machine learning environment that uh, we created in our previous challenge. Okay, so I'll set the timer on that. Now I'm gonna stop, stop sharing and I'll go back and take a look at the uh, existing questions. Okay, um, ask a question. Uh, created the first conda environment, and then at the prompt did the other environment with all the packages installed. So I created a sub environment within Python three, or at the prompt I just created multiple environment. Um, yeah, so mul definitely multiple environments. <clears throat> um, conda uh, environments are not, uh, yeah, they're not nested. They're not meant to necessarily compose really. Um, so definitely multiple environments. And you should be able to see that if you run the conda list uh, daemon, if you run the conda 
list command, you should have seen that there would have been two environments created uh, with those two commands. General advice, uh, mixing the default and Conda Forge channels. Uh, sometimes grabbing a package from Conda Forge because it's not on default results in a simple install. Right, okay, <clears throat> good question. Um, so, um, the kind of the community guidance on this, I think, is that the best the best practice is to um, always give Conda Forge preference over default. So you would always list in, in the Conda environment files that we're going to see in the GPU section. Notice that I always give Conda Forge higher priority over the default channel because that's kind of the established. Um, preference. And that works really well almost all the time, uh, except if you want to be sure that you are getting MKL, uh, because the, uh, the Conda Forge distributions of, say, NumPy and SciPy do not come built with MKL. So there are... Um, one way to do that is to you know, flip that preference around and give default uh, priority over Conda Forge. Um, that used to create some problems, but I haven't, I personally have not encountered any, any issues doing that myself. Um, but I think that um, a, f a few years ago, that that did create some problems uh, because of incompatibilities in the compiler tool chains that were used between the Conda Forge and the Conda Forge and default channel. But I think that those incompatibilities have gotten less and less over time. So just putting default as a higher priority has become less of an issue. Um, um, but the general guidance is to put Conda Forge as the higher priority channel. Uh, okay, so that was my timer. It's gone off, so I'm going to switch back to screen sharing now. Okay. Um, so hopefully you were successful in creating your, your custom kernel uh, for the machine learning environment. Uh, you can take a look at the solution. It's, it's uh, pretty much exactly the same. Um, if you don't specify, as in the solution here, I didn't specify the display name uh, parameter in the IPy kernel install command. That just means that um, by default, you'll get the same as the machine learning dash DMV name. Whatever you specify with the dash dash name will just get replicated with the display name. Um, Right, okay, so just wrapping up. So we saw how to create Conda in, um, environment files. Um, and we talked a little bit about how Conda environment files are useful for sh uh, sharing your Conda environments with researchers and enhancing the reproducibility and portability of your research. And then we wrapped up with a, a bit of an aside, which was basically how to create uh, custom kernels uh, for Conda environments uh, in an existing JupyterLab install. Okay. So, packages and channels. So this is the episode that I'm going to skip because I want to give good uh, good time to GPU um, uh, GPU packages package management. Okay, but just as a high um, a high level uh, overview. Um, so packages, the package structure is what gets mapped into the structure of a package, which is the um, kind of the uh, compressed uh, collection of binaries and things like that um, that are associated with a um, you know, particular package. Um, all have a very specific structure, and that structure then maps into the environment structure um, that uh, that you see when we looked a little bit into the environment directory. Um, the Conda channels 
uh, conda channels are basically locations where packages live on the internet and that conda knows about and will go to those channels to download packages. And it will go through conda, it will go through channels in a certain order, which is determined by the priority in which those channels are listed. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to see more examples about channels in the GPU episode, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But as you can see, there's quite a bit of detail about uh, conda packages and channels that you can go through um, at the end of this tutorial. So instead, what I want to do is skip ahead to managing GPU dependencies. So this is, what I think, one of the... Um, the great features of Conda and one that I have found incredibly useful for my own projects, most all of which are GPU accelerated now. Um, so in this episode, uh, which will conclude the tutorial, um, I want to show you which of the NVIDIA uh, GPU libraries are available via Conda um, and then what to do if you need the NVIDIA CUDA compiler uh, for your project. Uh, this doesn't uh, often, it doesn't come up a lot, but it's good to know that you can actually uh, solve this problem uh, with Conda if it does come up for you. Um, so the key objective is to show you how to use Conda to manage the key uh, dependencies for your next data science project. Um, and then, so we're going to see how to identify which versions of the important CUDA packages are available via Conda, and then understand how to write uh, Conda environment file for projects with GPU dependencies. And then at the end, we'll talk about um, some, uh, some issues of how to deal, two strategies for dealing with uh, the NVIDIA CUDA compiler. Um, right, so uh, let's dive in. So the first thing that I guess you need to do is if you're just starting out with uh, GPU uh, accelerated work is that you need to get familiar with the key CUDA libraries. So uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn um, and um, a whole new kind of ecosystem of packages to manage and Conda really helps manage uh, that complexity. So the first is the NVIDIA CUDA toolkit. That's kind of like the base, uh, base libraries uh, that are going to be needed for all of your uh, CUDA uh, GPU projects or NVIDIA <coughs> GPU projects. Then there is the um, NVIDIA Collective Communications Library or NICL. So this one is very specific to large scale deep learning. So the uh, Collective Communications Library is for inter GPU uh, communication both between uh, GPUs on the same node and GPUs on different nodes in a cluster. So if you're doing large scale deep learning, you're going to want uh, this nickel uh, library to efficiently manage the communication between multiple GPUs. Uh, the third is also a deep learning library is called QDNN. This is the NVIDIA uh, deep neural network library. Um, and it is uh, accelerates common computations that show up in deep neural networks uh, on the GPU. Um, of course, if you can go to NVIDIA and you can get all the documentation about how you can install all these libraries and things like that. But if you do system-wide installs, you, then you run into the same problem that you had that we talked about at the very beginning. Like, well, I could install a particular version of CUDA toolkit system-wide, but then I'm I'm stuck with that particular version. And what happens if I need to use TensorFlow in one project and PyTorch or another or Rapids or another or JAX or, you know, all these different uh, Python GPU packages. You know, there were many talks uh, earlier this week about various uh, Python uh, GPU accelerated packages and they all rely on CUDA. They all support maybe different versions of CUDA but maybe not the same versions of CUDA. Um, and so you might need different versions. Um, similarly with these other libraries, like they all have versions and, you know, so you just want to uh, be able to manage that complexity. So the first question is, are NVIDIA libraries actually available via Conda? The answer is yes. So if we go, um, if we go back, so I will just uh, clear this out, clean this up a little bit. Uh, so if we do a Conda search for a CUDA toolkit, 
Uh, then in a minute, it will return some results. All right. So um, it finds uh, on the kind of the main, which is one of the default, one of the two default channels, finds several versions of CUDA. We've got CUDA 9, CUDA 9.2. Um, three, four versions of CUDA 10, uh, CUDA 10.0, 10.1, and 10.2. Um, the version of CUDA toolkit that I use most often is this one, CUDA 10.1.243. So it's basically the most recent version of CUDA 10.1. And the reason for that is that this version of CUDA is the one that seems to be most widely supported across all of the various GPU accelerated packages that I have used. So that's PyTorch, TensorFlow, Rapids, um, DAX, Numba, like they all have support for uh, this version of the CUDA toolkit. Uh, PyTorch by default is now supporting CUDA 10.2, but that's a relatively new, uh, new development. Um, and certainly if you want to use PyTorch with CUDA 10.2, then you're going to definitely need to have the ability to use CUDA 10.1 with TensorFlow, which tends to lag in these things. Okay. Um, interestingly, so NVIDIA also has their own Conda channel. Um, and so if you wanted to search the NVIDIA channel for CUDA toolkit, then you can just pass the dash dash channel and you'll see that um, NVIDIA has um, even more versions of CUDA um, available. So they actually have CUDA 11 available <laughs> from NVIDIA. Um, but notice if you compare the build numbers to, so for example, here are, um, Uh, two build numbers for uh, for CUDA toolkit ten dot two dot eight nine actually three and uh, one's from NVIDIA one's from Packages Main they have slightly different build numbers because they correspond to uh, uh, probably slightly different uh, um, maybe compiler settings or things like that. But I tend to pick up my CUDA toolkits from the main channel, one of the defaults channels, and not necessarily the uh, NVIDIA channel. Although you would need to use the NVIDIA channel if you wanted to get CUDA 11. But I'm not really sure what supports CUDA 11 yet, so that might be a moot point. Okay, uh, so what about CUDA and N? So we could do the same thing. <coughs> um, if we do Conda, uh, search. Uh, I'll just pop the NVIDIA channel in here as well for CUDA and N. <clears throat> so lots of different versions of CUDA and N. So now we have CUDA 8, which supports, uh, or sorry, CUDA and N version 8 for CUDA 10.2 or CUDA 11. The most common version of um, QDNN is 7.6.5. That's the one that is used by, um, I think, most all of the deep learning libraries. And you can see that it's available for the different versions of, of CUDA 10, 10.1, 10 10.2, 10 things like this. Okay, so that takes about QDNN. So then we can check on the other one. So Conda search. Nickel. And uh, here we go. So Conda search Nickel. So um, there are a few versions of, well, one version of Nickel that's available via the NVIDIA channel, but it's a bit older. Uh, and then a really old one on the main channel, but actually most all of the 
more current versions of, of Nickel are all coming from Conda Forge. So if you need to use Nickel in your project, then you'll definitely need to add the Conda Forge channel to your environment file. We're going to see an example of that uh, in a minute. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to pop back to the lecture notes. So I showed you how to kind of search around and find the different uh, CUDA libraries that are available via Conda. And we touched on all the core ones, so the CUDA toolkit, uh, CUDA and Nickel. Um, so let's see some examples. So PyTorch, um, we'll start with PyTorch. So PyTorch is um, a very popular uh, open source machine learning library based on the Torch library, uh, very widely used, uh, particularly in uh, uh, research applications. And so here is an environment, a basic kind of environment file uh, for PyTorch. So um, if we, let's just copy it, and then I'll talk about the, the channel priorities. So I'm going to go back to my introduction to Conda. I'm going to add a new directory. I'll call this PyTorch environment. Oh, no. I will uh, rename this. PyTorch project, and in here, I'll create a new file. Uh, delete. Rename. Um, too many environment files open. Okay, paste. So here's our uh, PyTorch environment file. Now, the channels. So channels are specified just like dependencies, except they don't have version numbers. Uh, and the order, but now the order matters. So the order of these dependencies down here does not matter at all. Um, the order of the channels determines the priorities. So the way this will work is that when Conda goes to look for um, uh, CUDA toolkit, for example, it will first look for a CUDA toolkit package on the PyTorch channel. And if it doesn't find it, it will fall through to Conda Forge, where um, if it doesn't find it on Conda Forge, it will fall through to default. And similarly for the rest, it will go to pip, then Python, then PyTorch, then TorchVision. <clears throat> And so what will happen for most all of these, or for CUDA Toolkit, PIP, Python, it will fall through PyTorch and hit on either Conda Forge or default. It's important that you have PyTorch as having priority over Conda Forge. And the reason for this is that PyTorch has, um, Conda is the official way to install uh, PyTorch. And it, PyTorch has its own channel. And on its own channel, it provides effic uh, official uh, binaries for PyTorch that come pre-bundled with um, Nickel and QDNN that are basically built and I believe statically linked against the PyTorch binary. So um, that's why we don't include QDNN or Nickel in this environment file because it's redundant. However, if you were to do this the other way around, you did it like this, then there are builds of PyTorch that are available on Conda Forge and they'll get picked up uh, with this environment file. And I don't know what you'll get um, from the Conda Forge build. So if you're a PyTorch user, you always want to have PyTorch with priority over Conda Forge with priority over default. Okay. So now if we go and build uh, uh, kind of. Okay, so now we're ready to run our commands again. And again, it's the same command. So we're going to do conda environment create prefix file. 
And then I always add out of habit the dash dash force on the end, even though here it's not needed because there is no environment. But I just, this is the command that I type over and over and over when I create my environment. And so now we're going to create a, a PyTorch environment. Okay. I'll go back and talk a little bit more about channel priorities. So I, I mentioned this discussion about, uh, I, already, I already mentioned this about channel priorities and the importance of having PyTorch over ContaForge. Um, and there's an exercise here on TensorFlow that you can get started on uh, if you want, while the PyTorch uh, environment is, um, is downloading and getting set up. Oops. So um, while we're waiting for PyTorch, I would encourage you to um, you know, take three minutes and see if you can get this TensorFlow environment up and running. Um, and we'll come back to this uh, uh, in a minute. Um, and I will go back and check for questions. Let's check the questions. <clears throat> um, possible to specify a Git repo to install package from. So um, as uh, Michael pointed out, so you can, you can do that um, in an environment file um, using pip. And I'll see not an example of using Git, but an example of how you would add pip dependencies in an environment file um, in a more advanced use case. Uh, is there a way to use different Conda environments in different cells of a Jupyter notebook? Um, so I am I am not a so. The Jupyter notebooks do not support this at present. I'm not sure if it's, it's on the roadmap at all. Um, there are other notebooks that do, and if, well, that support something similar to this. I think there's something called like Polyglot that used to be, it's either a Netflix or an Uber project that was open source recently. I think it has this kind of uh, uh, functionality. Um, and I think somebody put a link in the chat to something else that provides uh, um, similar functionality that I hadn't heard of. Uh, personally, I am not. I can see the use case for having the ability to support maybe multiple languages within the same notebook in different cells. Like that conceptually makes sense to me. I can see use cases there, and that's something that Jupyter notebooks I think have supported for a while. Um, but it's having different, I feel like that is a recipe for confusion uh, more than anything else. Ah, um, if, so there's a good question by Michael. If I'm using a Conda environment to compile C++ applications, is the Conda environment automatically added to the compiler library path? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. So if you install, and there is an example uh, of this at the end of the lesson today, um, of where I give you kind of a, a recipe for um, using Conda uh, to install Horvod. And Horovod is a library for doing large-scale distributed deep learning. It also requires you to compile, when you create the environment, CUDA extensions or CPU extensions for um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, things like that. And so when you use the compilers, the relevant environment variables for those compilers are set to point to the compilers installed inside your Conda environment. So as long as you make sure that the compilers you want to use are either installed inside your Conda environment or available 
on your system path outside of your conda environment, then everything will work. Okay, so I'm going to pop back over to screen sharing now. And we're going to go back here. Okay, so it looks like PyTorch finished up. Um, so a couple of things about Py that's worth knowing about PyTorch, so you can see what's been downloaded here. Um, the, so we can see here's the CUDA toolkit. Uh, so that was installed. Um, and again, the official PyTorch binary includes CUDNN uh, and Nickel and, is, uh, and links against MKL. So you can see that's why these MKL packages have been installed. So PyTorch is the official PyTorch version from the PyTorch channel is quite accelerated and along many different dimensions. And so you definitely want to make sure that you set your PyTorch channel priority above Conda Forge to make sure that you get the, the best build for your operating system. Um, right. Okay. So let's go back and let's take a look at TensorFlow. Um, so let's just talk about the, uh, the solution here um, with TensorFlow. So um, TensorFlow doesn't have its own channel, um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but that does mean that you need to, uh, and, but TensorFlow also does not statically build in things like Nickel and Kudi and N into its binary that it, that it ships. So the solution is you need to specify Kudi Toolkit, of course, um, also Kudi and N, um, explicitly. Note that nickel here is specified explicitly as well. Um, and Kupti, Kupti is, a, um, is another NVIDIA library for profiling. It's optional. You don't necessarily need that. And then the other interesting thing is I, I like to add this MPI for Pi um, dependency to my TensorFlow environments um, and also usually to my PyTorch environments as well. Um, uh, if you have access to um, a um, a cluster that um, supports uh, CUDAware uh, MPI, then this MPI for Pi will be able to detect that, and it will install a CUDA aware uh, binary for Open MPI, which is uh, important. It will get you some. It will get you some good good speed ups from doing that. Um, so that's another little kind of best practice uh, tip or trick. And then for TensorFlow in particular, there's this package called TensorFlow GPU, which will make sure that you get the right um, uh, the right version of TensorFlow, the one that is built uh, for TPU or not TPU, it's for GPU. Sorry. Uh, and you can see in particular that this one will install uh, a GPU build for Python 3.7. So. Um, okay, so the next one that I actually wanted to uh, want to talk about, and here I think, because I know we're getting close to the end of time, so rather than actually trying to install and build these, um, I'll just kind of walk through them, and then we can leave a little bit of time to wrap up for questions. Um, so NVIDIA Rapids um, plus Blazing SQL plus Data Shader. So um, NVIDIA Rapids is a... Um, a relatively new um, uh, package for doing um, what typically had been done with like the pandas and scikit-learn uh, stack, but it, all of that accelerated on the GPU. So you know, pandas does all of your you know, your data cleaning, uh, your data monitoring, your feature engineering, transforming this kind of thing, and then you pass your pandas data frames into scikit-learn for you know, either more pre-processing and then finally uh, fitting of various machine learning models, but that's all done on the CPU. What Rapid wanted to do was take that, those libraries, but accelerate them for, for the GPU. And so they provide uh, various libraries for doing that, um, all installed via just specifying Rapids and, and the version number. Blazing SQL adds the ability to do GPU accelerated uh, SQL queries um, so you can, if you have a, you know, access to uh, data that either 
um, can be connected to Blazing SQL, like a SQL database, or it can be um, loaded into um, Blazing SQL, then you can run uh, SQL queries to extract data from that data source and they'll be accelerated on the GPU and they'll get returned into a uh, QDF, which is a GPU accelerated data frame that's provided via Rapids. And then you can do the entire ML pipeline from extracting from a SQL-like data store and accelerating that via the GPU and fitting uh, all the way through fitting models. So the whole kind of ETL tool chain or ETL pipeline plus uh, model fitting. And then visualization, there's now Data Shader and some other projects that are supporting GPU accelerated data visualization. So you, you can do everything on the GPU. And this, um, this uh, Conda environment file took a lot of uh, playing around with initially to get it to work properly. Um, and note how many channels are involved here. So Blazing SQL has their own channel and that needs to have highest priority. Rapids has their own channel. Um, and then NVIDIA and then Conda Forge and then default. Um, so if you, if you build this, um, and of course, if you're running it on your local machine um, and you're running Windows, this, uh, uh, this is probably something that I should have said at the outset. So GPU support right now is a very Linux uh, dominated uh, business. Um, Windows has some support for GPU libraries. Mac does not support uh, NVIDIA GPUs hardly at all. And so very few, uh, if any of the GPU accelerated libraries will have uh, binaries available for Mac. Um, so it's really a Linux, uh, uh, Linux dominated area. So some of these may not work on your local machines, depending on your, um, your environment. Now, most of them should work on uh, binder. Um, the, the one issue on Binder is that whilst we can use Conda to build the environment here, Binder doesn't actually have GPUs available for you to use for free. So you, you wouldn't actually be able to then fit a, uh, a PyTorch neural network, for example, with GPU acceleration um, via Binder, because Binder doesn't support GPUs at present. Maybe it will in the future, um, but, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, but it does not at present. Okay. Now, just to, to wrap up um, strategies for what to do if you need the NVIDIA CUDA compiler. Um, so by default, the CUDA toolkit package does not include the NVIDIA CUDA compiler in VCC. Um, sometimes you might have a, a, a package though that requires building custom CUDA extensions for accelerating some or all of that package on the GPU. Um, and maybe the authors have not made the binaries available that include the pre-compiled extension. In which case, if you want to use those extensions, you'll need to compile them yourself. And if you want to compile CUDA extensions, you need the CUDA compiler. And so how do you get the CUDA compiler? So the first thing to try is the CUDA toolkit dev package. So uh, the CUDA toolkit dev package, um, which is available via Conda Forge. So if we were to go back over here and do uh, uh, Conda search, I'll just add it explicitly, uh, Conda Forge, and then CUDA, toolkit and I'll put a star at the end to do a little bit of wildcard uh, pattern matching. That looks a bit garbled. Okay, so in a minute, this is gonna return CUDA toolkit. Okay, so notice that we've got uh, all the CUDA toolkits, but then we've got a whole bunch of uh, CUDA toolkit devs. So, um, 9.2, 10.0, 10.1, um, <clears throat> and different build numbers. Right, so CUDA Toolkit Dev is um, a version of the CUDA Toolkit that also includes the NVCC compiler. 
I don't really understand the reasoning behind why the CUDA toolkit itself does not include the compiler, but somehow NVIDIA has, in their licensing terms, has separated the compiler from like the CUDA runtime uh, libraries and the licensing is somehow different. And so the, the CUDA, the MVCC can be distributed on Conda Forge, but not via Anaconda. I, that, this part is a bit of a mystery to me. Um, and if there are any, if there happen to be any NVIDIA folks hanging out uh, in this tutorial, it'd be nice to have a, um, maybe a better explanation of, of why there's, why there, there needs to be a difference. Um, but you can specify uh, just the CUDA toolkit dash dev, basically put that in there. Um, and then there is another, there's some other packages if you want to have uh, C++ or C compilers, there's a package called uh, CXX dash compiler, which will pick up the right C and C++ compilers compatible with the rest of your um, packages. Um, and then that will allow you to compile uh, custom CUDA extensions. And the example that I have here is for um, a project called PyTorch, uh, PyTorch Cluster and PyTorch Geometric, which basically um, will download uh, and then build the compile or compile the CUDA extensions to accelerate these libraries on the GPU. And there's another little a trick that I put in here is where, so here, um, here's an example of how you would specify pip dependencies in a Conda environment file. So you just have, you know, you've got your pip and then you have a pip key and then a bunch of values which would map to uh, packages that should be installed via pip install. Um, and you can do some things here like pass in, um, not just names of packages, but other syntax to the pip install command. Um, so here I'm passing basically, instead of listing out packages individually to install via pip, I tend to just have this one line, um, which is a little special, which basically says pass this requirements.txt file to the pip install command and install everything in that file via pip. And I do that because then I have this nice separation between the Conda environment file has all the has all the Conda install stuff. And then my pip requirements file has all my pip install stuff and it just keeps it separate and neat. Um, and then there's this, um, some extra syntax that you can provide in pip requirements files to specify which pip packages should never be installed um, as a binary and should always be compiled. And so here, by having these no binary packages, it forces these packages to be compiled from source and they'll be compiled using NVCC and the C compilers installed in the Conda environment. So this is a very advanced use case that combines both Conda and PIP and compiles custom GPU extensions. Um, but this is, these are kind of um, tips and tricks from the field, so to speak. Um, I've had, I had several users at Calc that had exactly this problem, which turned into a nice, I think, uh, teaching example for this tutorial. Um, however, um, the CUDA toolkit dev package is a, is a bit inconsistent depending on the version of 10.1 tends to work well, pretty consistently, but I've run into problems with other older versions of the CUDA toolkit dot dash dev package. So there's another way <clears throat> which involves installing manually the CUDA toolkit itself. Um, but then there's this NVCC underscore Linux 64 package, which basically tricks your Conda environment into seeing a system wide installed version of the CUDA toolkit and thinking that it exists inside your Conda environment. And then this is an example. Uh, this environment file is an example of how you can use um, the uh, con or how you can use Conda and this NVCC uh, Linux 64 package to install uh, Horvod, 
and build all of the custom CUDA extensions that are required to support PyTorch, TensorFlow, and MXNet on Horovod with MPI uh, and Glue support um, via Conda. And this is a quite a complicated uh, example um, that I worked on and was recently contributed to the official Horovod documentation. Um, so if you have Horovod project and you've always wanted to use Conda, this is the this is now the way to go, um, and it also uses that same trick of where I install some things in the pip requirements file, and then I no binary Horovod to make sure that it's always compiling. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I'm rushing a, a bit, but I know we're out of time. So, uh, yes, Michael. Uh, I was just going to warn you that you're at about four minutes. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to um, yeah. I'll wrap. So the rest of this basically walks through this extended Horovod example, explains a bit more of the details, and then how um, you know, here for Horovod, I have to set some custom environment variables. So you can set those in a, in a bash script and then just put everything in a bash script, basically. Um, and then I have a single bash script that, run, that is used to create the Conda environment um, and um, automates that whole process now. So we covered a lot of ground very quickly there. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, so I'm going to stop screen sharing. And whew. so thank you guys so much for attending this tutorial. This is my first SciPy tutorial. So it was a bit, uh, a bit nerve wracking. So I hope you all uh, uh, thank you for putting up with me. And I hope you all learned a lot. Um, and I will hang out on the Slack channel for pretty much the rest of the conference and uh, answer questions as I see them. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and just um, logistics note for people, the keynote or the welcome in the keynote introduction and the keynote starts in uh, 45 minutes. Um, so get your lunches or breakfast or whatever it is you're doing done before then. Um, yeah. And thanks David for a really great tutorial. Um, I, I learned a lot in between monitoring. So, um, yeah. So unless there's anything else, I will end the broadcast and then everybody can go, um, take a break before the next session starts. Oh, I would just say one more thing. So, um, as I said, the lesson materials are being developed collaboratively via uh, the Carpentries Incubator program. So, if you see any issues or you have any input, please feel free to open an issue or or PR or or something. Um, I'd be happy to incorporate any any material or or clean up any issues you found in the training materials. So, thanks again. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, we'll see you in 45 minutes.